All right, we are live. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, is it after? It's afternoon somewhere. I'm sure it's evening. No good question. Hi, good In the morning. UK, probably no question. Uh, uh, all right. So, a couple of things. I was watching um, passing on Netflix. I'm not quite finished with it. Nella Larson's um, yes, 1926 tone mm -hmm. turned into a, a flick. No, let, let me find out. You got the book hand. We yeah, didn't. I do. It's over here somewhere because I, I I pulled. I got a couple of copies of it. Oh, yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Passing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's, <laughs> yeah. It. that's it. That's yeah. it. It's public domain, too. I'm going to probably have it. Good. We're going to get just, it. It's just a little over 100 pages. It's not very long at all. How How is it so far? Uh, artistic. I would expect that. It, it had the artistic. It's got the film noir kind of look. It looked like black and white in the commercial. It's black and white. It's, black and white. it's you know, a lot of jazz. A lot of doo -doo 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 with the piano. Yeah. It's beautiful. Beautifully shot. Beautifully acted. It's the pacing is slow. You know, they're, they're, they're developing. Uh, the brother that plays the husband to Irene, he was also in The Nick. He played a doctor. So, like, I'm Oh, my man. Yeah, he's a doctor in this. He's a little boxer. You know, like he's... Oh, is he he's a boxer too? No, no. In in the Nick, he was a boxer. In the not in the Nick, he just had all kind of rage issues. Oh my god! Well, he he has similar. I think he's the same character. I think they just Andre him. Holland is it? I think so because he was in uh, was that Midnight? Um, was it yeah. Moonlight? Moonlight too. Moonlight. He was in Moonlight yeah. and the Nick. And I, and you know what? I don't know what happened to the Nick. Did you ever talk? Did you talk to any of the cast? I was hoping they would get. They, they had a race thing going on. It was very interesting, and then it just okay. went away. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it was on a, a streaming platform before we had all of these streaming platforms where Cinemax. it wasn't supported. Yeah, it wasn't supported at the level. That, that was a really amazing show because I got to see, you know, to, to see a black doctor living in a tenement, you know, like somebody that went through all of that schooling to always be overlooked. And then so there's some shades of that in passing, of course. Uh, he's trying to teach his sons about lynching and his wife is like, can they just be children? And oh, he's here like, we go. Oh, no, they can't. They mm -hmm. live in this country. I told you we should have left. And I was thinking about our conversations here. Yeah. How about that? Except <laughs> yeah. hard place. This 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 is a terrible place. Yeah, we should leave. It's uh well, I mean, in fact, it's so funny. Today's uh today's New York Times covered it. Who has the most historic responsibility for climate change? A group of rich countries, just 12% of the global population today, produced half of all greenhouse gases in the past 170 years. The United States has done 20, almost a quarter of it. Um, uh, China is second in uh, about 14%. Anyway, long story short, ain't nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Right. Damn. They're going to kill us all. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, the, the very people responsible for it now are like, oh, let's, we have to do something. Yeah, I mean, but you know that cosplay coal miner who uh, makes about half a million dollars a year, and his wife makes about half a million. Who, whose son now is running the co the coal company and energy company they have in West Virginia? That would be Joe Manchin. Uh, of course, he is uh, apparently the mummy. Joe Biden was so shook <laughs> by Manchin that he wouldn't even sign on to the damn climate accord they negotiated in Scotland last week. Uh, I, so, I think you mean a half a billion. Because uh, Joe Manchin. No, I mean, no, I mean, on, on terms of annual stock okay. dividends. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he's. He, okay. Yeah, I was like. He, 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 even though his state is either fiftieth, forty ninth, forty eighth, and damn near everything, and there are no billionaires there, it looks like uh, Mr. Mr. Energy, who is over right now the energy policy in the House of Representatives, over the committee okay. anyway. Like uh, he maybe he's angling to be the first West Virginia billionaire. But he damn sure don't care whether we die. And apparently he thinks he can actually breathe coal dust or maybe he don't care. Maybe, you know, he may be one of them fundamentalist Christians that uh, the governor of Mississippi was talking about for, for whom death is just a portal to the other side. Although if it is, I, I think they're probably in for a rude um, uh, a barbecuing. I mean, awakening, whatever. I mean, I'm saying <laughs> heat and coal make diamonds, right? Or something pressure. Mm. Well, yeah, but you have to have the fundamental elements inside. So in this case, I think pressure would probably just create dust. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> but Ooh. yeah, but no, yeah. I mean, there's no place to run, no place to hide. So where are you at? In, in I'm, I have twenty minutes left. I mean, I'm gonna you know, oh, good. I'll just finish it. You know. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's decent. And last week it was you know hardly fall and you know um it's yeah, there's, a, there's a there's a lot of interesting content coming down. You know. I think it was Shang Chai's on HBO Max. I might be checking that out this week. Uh, oh, did they move it over there? Yeah, they did. Like, and that's and so did, funny because growing up, we all said Shang Chai because we read the comic books, and it took 
I think Marvel making it into a film for us to understand that for decades we were saying Shang Chi when it was Shang Chi. <laughs> but, oh, no. no, but but you we stop thinking about it. We know Chi, we know CHI. We've been saying that all the time. It just it's just the, it just shows you how a film market, which is the largest market, and in a minute and we probably should talk about Nollywood and Bollywood today for a minute in the context of hard they fall. I mean, hard they come. I keep saying that because it's Jimmy Cliff, but. Um, no, the hard they fall was right. Hard hard fall. Fall. right. Um, but it's so funny how a billion plus people in the world don't exist for people in the United States. So even something like that, which we have all, and I'm not aware of anybody who pronounced it correctly. You know, I, Shang, you know Shang, me neither. I mean, Shang-Chi, I mean, we would say Shang-Chi. We grew up reading Shang-Chi. He was a Marvel character. And it took the movie coming out. Oh. Oh, oh my. And shout out to Aquafina, who clearly understands passing. Uh, in other words, passing isn't just a black to white thing. Passing is across in racial borders and culture. In fact, uh, uh, what's the, cat, the uh, person's name? Uh, mm, Yoshiri Kanojo. I had to think. Yeah, don't, don't get me. I'll put your name in it. No, no, no. You uh, wrote a book called Covering. Mm. It's interesting. It's a concept of covering. In fact, last week, uh, in my in my class at law school, we, we were reading a chapter in our in our case book. Derek Bell, I, ironically, his case book, Race, Racism, and American Law, which we have we have to supplement. There's a new edition coming out, and so we're going through each chapter, looking like what needs to be added. We, we update the case law, this kind of thing, and where we just did the chapter on interracial intimate relationships and everything from interracial marriage to interracial adoption to all this kind of stuff. And then we talked about passing, covering you know, where you are attempting to suppress. And and, and, she, and this author was writing particularly about people of Pacific Rim, you know, Asian, generally speaking. And it's just fascinating because all of it is still dictated in many ways by whiteness. Which doesn't, which is not real. I mean, even the notion of interracial, we're the same race. Well, is- you would think, unless you're somebody like uh, James, uh, uh, what's his name? And um, is it? Crutchfield, the principal, the brother in Texas, who they basically gave a, a tried to give a career lynching, and then oh, uh, whatever, they, whatever they paid him to go away. It reminded me of that line in Malcolm X, an autobiography from Malcolm X, when Malcolm looked around at the lawyer when him and Shorty, J- Malcolm Jarvis, were uh, were up for burglary, and they and they let the white girls off with a slap on the wrist, and they put them in jail. And Malcolm said. I think we're being sentenced because of those girls. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm told the lawyer, I, I think we're being sentenced because of those girls. And then, of course, in the film, they, they take that line out where Denzel, you hear him saying, our crime wasn't breaking and entering. Our crime was sleeping with white women. So they got that, brother. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of race not being real, <laughs> I mean, would you would you have taken that deal? Clearly, they wrote him a check because he's good. He's on administrative paid leave until August 23. You know, I mean, but it also kind of begs the question of being in Texas in that particular area. You know, it's like some of us have deluded ourselves into thinking, that, you know, it's, uh, you know, well, the people, they treat us, they, they, they treat me well. You know, certain things crack open the reality that many of us know, which is what, you know, in passing the husband was saying, you know, these boys, I'm gonna tell them about lynching because they just got called the N-word. So that, let's, let's have that conversation. So they're not surprised. None of us should be surprised, right? That's because cool. ultimately when it comes down to it, we are seeing people in Virginia fiercely fight for something that doesn't really exist, but it defines who they are. That's and right. when you start talking about definition of self, you know, that's a hard, hard thing to walk away from for a lot of people. Well, I'm, I'm grateful this morning that in, in us having this kind of opening up this way that still a, after what are we? 80, 88, I 80, think 88, crazy, crazy 88. Good number. No question. 88 keys. Yes. Well, no, no, I, I love the way. No, see, you may be bigger. I'm, I'm loving this conversation because we've done now. We, we are in such a good rhythm, and now with the addition of, um, of office hours to the suite oh. of, uh, you know, with, with uh, Dr. Amon getting us healthy, and with Uraeus and 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 the Nubian nation just growing and really having conversation. And I know he's working now on the, uh, the chat function because even Monday night. And shout out to that. Oh, by the way. Um, just to update everybody who was there Monday for office hours, when the family came in from Baltimore and the, uh, the four-year-old had asked her mother about, 
So Morgan. The Morgan asked about um was it more Morgan is the is Morgan the six year old or Morgan? Morgan's the four year old, Micah's the six year old. Micah, yes. Yes. Micah. Mike, Micah had asked, thank you for, yes, right. Micah had asked about Howard French's book, Born in Blackness. And so, you know, I, I gave her a little short answer, but I didn't give her a long answer because I said, oh, I'm going to uh, reach out to Howard. And then it occurred to me, well, I don't need to ask him. You ask him. So I, 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 I Howard and French and I had correspondence and he's now, we're going to hook him up and she's going to ask him directly the question yeah. she asked her mom. So I'm, I'm just saying, so I'm just saying that happened between, I'm saying, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you need to go back and look at it. But the point I was trying to make is that in the chat, every time we're having these conversations, all of this, it's almost like we're writing books every Monday night. Everybody's coming in with their experience, their knowledge base, their background and just alone that chat alone just fills up with i mean all the connections being made right. the brother the father was from ghana so you see these Ghanaians come in and so oh, whatever then you know who talking about mississippi alabama oh i'm from there I'm from there and it's, and it's like wait a minute so i mean it's just it is amazing and, and uh we're not going to be on youtube live today because you are going to be i just want to um uh, oh yeah we would normally be doing that here. That's yeah, right. Yeah, and there will be a chat going on in, on YouTube today, but there will not be. But this is there is a chat going on right now in Nubia, uh, because folk are up at six thirty in the morning to be a part on of the it. East Coast, three thirty on the West Coast. Oh my gosh, yes, that's right. Of, of the United States. Now there are others who are uh, just right near. Like this is probably a little bit easier on our man Oz. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> as is a, yeah, he, he's in he's in the UK. Like whew, I ain't got to get up four day in the morning. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I already see AJ, Letty, uh, Michael, Laura, all in the yes. chat right now. Uh, oh, there they go. There is everybody. Good morning, Michelle and Sandra. Look at Tanya. Good morning. Yeah. Tanya's into? Yeah, I see Tanya just came in. Hey, Nikki Parker. All right. All right, Jay Rebels. All the people are here. Yeah. <laughs> that is here. Oh. Yeah, no, so yeah, I just came in. Yeah, but no, no, we're not. Well, we're not because they're having a, well, they, we are having a, a Howard unity day um at, at at howard university on the main quadrangle um we just passed the 30-day mark the month mark of the young people who um reacting to a meeting that the howard student government um facilitated between the student body and the upper administration in which nobody from the upper administration came and that's what sparked a month ago now the the 12th of october what has become known as the um the blackburn takeover blackburn university student center on howard's campus as we've talked about before and uh, this is day 31 now and to mark that um howard alumni have decided um to um, gather on campus today for a brief kind of um love for howard show of unity um requiring us to be our best selves support for the students support for everybody in in terms of the institution um a gathering today for two hours at 12 to 2 eastern time here in the u.s and they asked me to participate and even though you know i went to tennessee state but it's an hbcu and i feel like you know i i joke with them all the time one time i was down at morehouse they gave a talk uh my man um david wall rice sam livingston and them, them boys uh the crew um which you know we were recruit, recruit all, recruiting all of them to come into nubia we're gonna say less about that now but uh professor hunter you know knows we, we, we've all she, the two of us have had the conversation we we, pl we planted some some big things but at any rate I was down there for for them when they give a talk, Dan Black, Nate Norman, all the people, Tanya Clark, all the people who teach in the AUC, my colleagues. And and as I opened the talk, I said, you know, I'm down from Howard for the day. I went to Tennessee State. I said, but, you know, in my mind, it's only it, it's all one big HBCU. Mm -hmm. And then it was just stone silence. And then I said, I know y'all don't believe that. Then they just all bust out laughing. <laughs> I know, but you'll believe it soon enough. So anyway, I'm going to be there today. and. Um, uh, one of you, one of your partners, you said Chuck gonna be there. Chuck, oh, yeah, Chuck, Chuck Modiano, who was uh, who he said you inspired him to go to Ferguson. Well, mm. I, I believe he got arrested. Uh, <laughs> Chuck be in the Chuck be in the front. 
Chuck, Chuck can get arrested. <laughs> in fact, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of an old adage my friend Dr. Fia Zakia used to always say, who taught in the AUC for years. She, uh, she's the daughter of Mississippi. Afia used to always say, she would quote Aikwe Arma. I think it was Aikwe Arma that wrote this, said, um, you know, we talk about the, the scholars in Africa. And when you go to when you go to battle, he said the scholars are in the front line. They're not in the rear trading beads. So Chuck Modiani is <laughs> is one of those intellectuals who's a working intellectual, a writer, a front front line journalist. And when he when he is in the front, like he was, um, you know, Black Lives Matter DC has been very active. People have been in the streets protesting police brutality, and Chuck is in the front. So when y'all see that stuff, like when Trump was holding that upside down Bible over there in front of the church, across from the White House, he, he do a pan. Chuck Modiani is there. You know and Chuck caught that here again. Charlottesville um, um, had a yeah. murdered, uh, and he was there taking film and getting people arrested uh, who were responsible because his camera was always on, and he's there. He's been there at Blackburn just yeah. about every day. So he was like, "I will be there." I will yeah. be there. I, I was like, to in front of Dr. Carr, make sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, all the crack. In fact, uh, April Silver, my man Jam, uh, Dr. Stephen Jackson, used to be the principal of Dunbar High School. All of them went to school together. And there's so many others. Donald Temple, who is the counsel for the students in Blackburn. And, and uh, the featured speaker will be the current mayor of Newark. Rast is coming down. Baraka. So this is going to be kind of very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Will there be a Dean Sherrod? Never mind. Um, so well, no, I mean, apparent. Well, you know, yes, we had ancestors work because you can't, like in that clip we've all seen with the sisters, you know, the Felicia Rashad, Debbie Allen standing there on the porch of fine arts, and uh, Debbie Allen looks around and says, So, what are the students' uh, demands being addressed? Or have their needs been addressed? And you hear that, no. That was one of the alumni that's going to be here today. Who shall remain nameless? <laughs> I only found that out like a couple of days ago. Say with y'all. I said, "What? Well, that was you?" Yeah, man. Oh, man. So, you, you know, it's really an impossible situation. I think for because you want to do what's right, but we both know, as faculty members at universities, when you are new to a place, you. You want, particularly a place like Howard, you want to believe, or any black college, you want to believe that place is the place you imagined it to be when you were a student, if you went to one of those schools, or or it is the place that it projects itself to be when you're not there. Then you get there, and in the time it takes you to adjust your vision to realize that there's a, still a gap between the vision and the reality. Mm. Now, but, but, you know, Dean Rashad, uh, my friend Tanasi Coates, um, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones have all come into Howard at this moment. Now, Tanahasi knows better because Tanahasi went to Howard and he was there for a lot of that. Now, I haven't seen any public pronouncements from Tanahasi, and I understand that you know, some I don't know, I don't want to attribute any motive, I want to attribute any reason, and at the same time, I haven't seen anything publicly from Jelani. Cobb, my friend Jelani Cobb at Columbia. I want to attribute any motive. I think, and in, in the case of Nicole, of course, the 1619 Project book just came out. She's everywhere doing, you know, remarks, tours, you know, white folk throwing bombs at her. She deflecting them, throwing stuff back. I think there is a, there's a difference between fighting the concept of whiteness and white nationalism, rather, and trying to decenter that and displace that, and doing the governance structure work of day to day intimate interaction with work through with our people. That is that is infinitely different. It is much. That's why we had to have we had to have that Africana studies framework. And I, th I think we also have to start to value ourselves ourselves enough to not accept less like we we were forced for 400 years to accept chitlins to accept the entrails accept right. the, the tail of the cow and the foot the hoofs of the pig and whatever mm -hmm. whatever we could get we were forced Ox tails, to, no we question <laughs> forced to make it delicious That's so we right. are inherently built to accept crap and and make do with it but that's not who we are from our origins. So I think it shouldn't be. 
it's, it's time for us to stop making do with crap. And, and how, do we, how do we do that? I mean, how do we approach that? And again, I'm just naming those and I see in the chat somebody's brought up the vice president. So yeah, she ain't saying nothing either. So oh, yeah, I forgot she was no alum. Um, yeah, and, and that's part of it. It's kind of easy to forget these days. Yeah. It is. It's kind of easy to forget her, period. She's not been very... Did um, you see that long article? It was Vanity Fair, or I'd have to find the magazine now, The Incredible uh, Disappearing Vice President. But really, in, in all fairness to that position, she's now that. retreated to the mean of that's what vice presidents are. They're invisible. And and I'm not so sure if she wasn't picked to be just that. And people were talking yesterday oh. on my show about, you know, Pete Buttigieg, maybe he should be, because I'm like, can Biden actually run again, like, really effectively? And if not, and I don't, anyway, we should have this conversation in office hours, but, you know. Should we? Should we? Yeah, we should. We should. Okay, okay. we'll say less then. We're still public facing. We're breaking, uh, the, we're breaking the internet, too, every week, man. People just coming into to Nubia like, yo, yeah. Yeah, it's straight have, freedom. Bandwidth. Uh, but I don't think it's yeah. any secret, though. I mean, we saw Jamie Harrison, of course, uh, serving, you know, and when Jamie Harrison, you know, we all know he's window dressing. We had that little bit. Did y'all talk? Have y'all talked about that this week? Well, Jamie Harrison will be on my show on Monday, I think. Monday. Really? He comes on every month now. Um, so Wonderful. Like, yeah, I don't know. He keeps coming back. Well, it's though. amazing how whiteness will drive you home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you got to have some you government. Know, to, to, in his not in his defense, because he needs no defending. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe he believes that he can make a difference. Like I, no I question. Really, I really, in his heart, he really believes that no he can do something. Um, and and you know, by how he's going about it, like to do that, you'd have to be super radical. You you know, you can't you can't come in with the same ingredients and think it's going to taste different. Like you got the same ingredients. What what you making? You still making? The cake, the cake still's got the same ingredients. So you want to make something different, you need different ingredients. And you you're not you're operating, you got their bowl, you got their ingredients, you got their right. like what what are you doing? You know, so oh I'm gonna put a little <laughs> vanilla in it. No, that's still that's not a little chocolate, chocolate chips, no, still the same and same, same recipe. Now, now what do you do? I mean, that's interesting. You say that because when you do that, and Harrison has definitely done that, he's not the first, won't be the last. And I agree with you. He I think he believes it. I mean, I don't know Jamie Harrison, but I mean he, it seems like he believes it. What do you do when what you are preparing is nutritious? I mean, I looked at the debates between he and Lindsey Graham, and just about everything Jamie Harrison said would benefit everyone in the state of South Carolina. And then Lindsey Graham came behind him with, yeah, well, you know, I just, you know, the, here's the primal screen to you white boys to vote for me. This guy's radical. He's dangerous. And uh, he, if he's a, he's elected, he'll have the radical, radical agenda. And, 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 and I support President Trump and I do it. And I'm listening, I'm saying, you're not saying anything, but you're saying everything because this man has prepared a nutritious meal. And what people have said is, I'd, I, I'd rather die. I, I just rather, I'd rather eat poison. So if if I were advising, yes, I, would, please. I would say, say it. So anybody That's that- move, is, right? Yeah, Say what it is. Uh, so you're voting, you're not, you're not voting for yourself, you're voting for whiteness. And if that's more important, there's nothing I can do about that. But let's be clear, you're not voting, but because there's a clear choice here. You're not voting based on what is actually going to be delivered to you. You're voting on on a concept. There it is. So there it let's, is. let's just put it out there. I don't know why we play footsies with this. No, yes, you did. You just answered it. You said you, you said it, you said it, I think perfectly. They believe it. They believe it. I mean, I look at the former president of the United States, President Obama, went to Scotland. And you know how he does. He he uh, he gives those talks with that kind of sideways look with the pursed lips. So he, like like he's really dropped a mic or something. And so, uh, you know, we talk about climate change. And the reality is, if uh, if we don't do something, we're, we're all going to die. <laughs> and I'm like. You the president for two whole ass terms, Chief. Whole ass. Going around the world scolding people now. Not only don't you get any points, you don't get any negative points either. Because I'm looking at you like we should just turn the volume down. And I ain't mad at you because you believed it. Jamie Harrison believes it too, but his behavior says that. And so if you advise him to do that, I'm thinking about the first black chairperson 
of the Democratic National Committee, and that would be Democratic Party. That would be Ron Brown. Right? Oh, it, well, yeah. I mean, you know, and 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 again, this isn't a defense of two party electoral politics because we know that these, you know, many of the Democrats are soft white nationalists. They are the only alternative in a two party system for those progressives like the Yana Presleys and the AOCs and others. And at the same time, the black presence in the Democratic Party, which really begins, as we know, that shift in the 1930s with the Roosevelt administration on the on the national level. And then the the infiltration of the Democratic Party in the South is triggered by the fact that it was the only game in town. There was no two party system in the South. The Republican Party having been effectively purged. In fact, um, we'd have to look it up. But I think 1901, George White, the last elected uh, congressperson of African descent for decades, uh, I think he finished his term in November 1901. He's the one who made the famous speech as he was leaving his last address in the House of Representatives where he said, we will be back like the Phoenix. We will rise from the ashes. And that became a um, a battle cry of the Congressional Black Caucus when it was founded decades later. But George White was a Republican. And uh, but the Democrat, but, but they they basically destroyed the Democratic Party in the South because the Democratic, I mean, the Republican Party in the South, because we know the Republican Party, of course, was the party of the conquering armies of the Union. And black people joined the Republican Party because it was the first political party that people of African descent who had been formerly enslaved could join in the wake of the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments. And it was a way of ensuring northern, uh, I'll say northern um, union, union power in the South. That's what Reconstruction was. I mean, he would say well, Reconstruction was about race. Now, it really wasn't about race for Lincoln. It wasn't about race for Grant and them. Sure, they had some, you know, some progressive ideas about black people, and they were also racist in many ways. And uh, who cares? That's a social structure conversation. But we used the, the Republican Party to advance our interests. That's the whole, we've been talking about that just about every week. Uh, certainly, Every other week when we talk about Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, uh, the recent exhibit at the National Museum of African History and Culture and Reconstruction. But I ain't going to go down this road too far. I just want to say that by the 1930s, however, the Republican Party has been addressing its race problem, which is us, and beginning the purge in the North. Um, the, the Lily White movement, go look at Herbert Hoover's policies and, you know, the Depression, of course, laissez-faire capitalism, because the Republicans have always been the party of business, so to speak. Both parties are, but the Republicans ain't got no pretense about it. There was also an economic engine driving the creation of the Republican Party in the 1850s. You know, they couldn't let the South get away because you, it's bad for business. But anyway, it's a story for another day. And there are a number of books on this in terms of black Republicans. There's The uh, Dilemma of the Black Republican. Uh, that's one book. Um I'd have to now I'd have to pull them all up in my mind. I'm and usually when it, when I'm thinking about a, a book like that, I would have to see the cover in my mind, and I could just read the cover off the uh, off the. And and these books have been being written since the 1950s and 60s because you know they got those so-called uh, um, Lincoln Republicans, you know, black folk who came up in the Republican Party, persisted in the Republican Party. Ed Brooke would be, for example, out of Massachusetts. But anyway. Um, by the 1950s and 60s, of course, the war in the South is the war to crack open the Democratic Party. The roots for that were laid in the 1930s and 40s with the election law cases, Charles, Charlie Houston and boys, uh, and then followed by in the wake of his students like Thurgood Marshall and then the others like Constance Baker Motley and all of them. They're attacking voting rights. So the white primaries in Texas, Smith versus All Right, all this, you know, uh, Maceo Smith, we talked about him when, last year, we talked about Juneteenth, these black local on the ground warriors so i mean i would encourage our, our brother james the principal there in, in coley field texas as he continues says you want to continue his work as an educator dig into the history of the black elected officials in texas um no i won't <laughs> go i think i have my texas books in the other room but anyway some of them anyway but the point i'm trying to make is this very quickly that attack on voting rights was a strategic uh leverage of of local uh, local networks of black leaders well, i think we actually make a note of that we're gonna come back to that in a second but um on an unrelated topic but in that process they're they're fighting to get in the democratic party because th in the south they've shut out the republican party it doesn't exist as we talked about a couple of weeks ago that's how Connolly's rice parents could register as republicans in alabama because nobody cared if you registered as a republican because republicans ain't gonna win no damn elections so in the 60s, after they successfully win these voting rights cases, and you get the Voting Rights Act of 65, as the black folk really are infiltrating the, the Democratic Party, the 
exodus from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, as we know, has already begun. It began in the 1950s in the wake of Little Rock and all that when Strom Thurmond and them signed that Southern Manifesto. These Democrats, these are because the because the Democrats are the party of the quote unquote working man, the working man. I don't even say woman, right? Which means the, the, the hard scrabble whites. This goes back to one of the architects of the Democratic Party, of course, old Hickory, Andrew Jackson, the Indian killer, who, uh, of course, was a successful uh, one of the founders of the Democratic Party. And the idea is these are the unlettered, you know, these are the hillbillies. Uh, these are the people who, when Jackson was inaugurated uh, at the presidency, came to the White House. At that time, he just walk up to the White House and knock on the door, and he threw open the doors for all of his supporters to come in and celebrate with him. And them hillbillies came in there and smeared cheese on the walls and ate them, and took silverware out. You know, in other words, that good behavior that they continue to to foment in many ways. Uh, shout out to the January 6th crew, who apparently is going to get a slap on the wrist, which may even be a little more than Kyle Rittenhouse is going to go. To that judge up there, the KKK, keep Kyle from being convicted, uh, judge in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. But anyway, oh, wait, <laughs> not anyway, though. <laughs> now, I, I like them cats. People think I'm being facetious, but see, the sometimes some people, uh, remember that scene in uh, Cool Hand Loop when Strother Martin slaps Paul uh, Newman and he falls in the ditch and he's like. You see, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Some men you just can't reach. I mean, it pains him to slap Luke into that ditch because he keep running away. Some people ain't going to wake up and realize there is no bridge to be built to these people. My man's just sitting up there. You see him crack that Asian joke? Oh, my gosh. I, and see, I, a lot of people don't I, know. I'm like, I'm like, what is he auditioning for? No, he's letting the world know who he is with mm -hmm. his little with his little simple gold band on his ring to let you know I stand for values and protecting womanhood and I'm a straight shooter. You know, all them values that were in the banner sworn oaths of the Ku Klux Klan. If you go back to 1915, you know what I'm saying? 1866 in Plastic, Tennessee, 1915 in Indiana and, and Atlanta. I mean, he's letting you know. And so. Um, but that joke, and a lot of people, if you, if you don't know, when he said, you know, they're breaking for lunch, and he said, I hope this ain't coming from Long Beach, or and and uh, not Long Beach, um, yeah, Long Beach, that is a community in California where a number of Cambodians uh, came in the 1950s and 60s, and then when the Khmer Rouge uh, took power in Cambodia and engaged in mass murder, Paul Pot and them boys, a lot more Cambodians came in the 1970s and 80s and different cities in the United States um, accepted them. I went to school with some Cambodian kids. I'm talking about now, this would have been junior high school. So 1977, 78. So, uh, but anyway, I saw it to say that when he made that joke mm -hmm. and then named that community, he was being very specific. This is a this is a yeah, full people, throated people old race. Saying, he uh, oh he has dementia. I was like no he's auditioning. But now that you're talking, Doctor Carr, I feel like um, they know something. The, the boldness of Schroeder and not mm -hmm. just Schroeder that sure. uh, the, the defense attorney that stood up and talked about the black pastors coming in the Al Sharpton's in the you know the one that is in the uh, Ahmaud Arbery murder trial. Oh, but um, did you did you did you did, did y'all talk about that? Of course, of course. So you know, did, did anybody bring up Elaine Brown? No, come on now. This is the, I, no, I, 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 what that hillbilly did, and I love these white bring, boys. Bring up Elaine Brown. What, what these white boys, when he got up there and said, you know, uh, the right Reverend Al Sharpton, pause. Everybody pause. He says the right Reverend Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton's not Presbyter. He's not Catholic. Not Church of England. Anglican, meaning that the right reverend hmm. is not used in Sharpton's Baptist upbringing. Now, now, of course, you got the, as, as my dear friend and elder Jeremiah Wright would say, you know, they done fractured all the denominations now. So people making themselves bishop, you know, ding, I'm a bishop, <laughs> ding, I'm a bishop. So, I mean, you don't know, but I'm saying traditionally, you don't say the right reverend. That was the first slur. Then he said, uh, Jesse Jackson's gonna be in here. When you say things like in here or got in here, snuck in here, came in here, 
This is the language that is used to refer to vermin. How did this mouse get in here? Get in here. In other words, here is the place I live. The thing that has gotten in here is a pest, is a vermin, is an other. This is the coded language. Then he goes on to say, Jesse Jackson had been here since Elaine Brown ran for mayor. Elaine Brown, the former head of the Black Panther Party, ran for mayor in that town in a write-in vote in 2005. There had not been a mayor in that little town in Georgia ever, a black mayor, even though black people form the majority in that town. In the county, they're about 30%, but in the city, they're about, right now, I think 55%. Elaine Brown ran for mayor in a write-in campaign there. So this wasn't just, these weren't just throwaway lines, this hillbilly lawyer all shook some. No, nah, bro, you talking directly to your people, okay? White supremacy, okay? And so then he, then he closes with, which is why I found it intriguing that we've all kind of focused on the black preacher thing he led with. But then at the very end, he says, any black person, of public notoriety, any high profile black. And I'm wondering why having heard this, we continue to go back to the opening line. I mean, to me, this really isn't exercise in listening. He used coded language all the way through, but we got caught on Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. And then William Barber, of course, was in an overflow room watching. But I think what we almost have to do is very much like Steve Bannon, who indicted yesterday. Yeah, but he, he Mark Meadows uh, was supposed to testify before Congress. He didn't come. I mean, I love the fact that they're taking their constitution, their little flawed 18th century document. Can I have it? Yes, thank you very much. Here we go. I'm gonna make a little hat. No, no, I'm just gonna throw the shit. I think I'm just gonna eat it. I don't know. But there are no, there's no rule of law. Mm -hmm. Benny Thompson is the chair of the committee. Benny Thompson is like, well, you know, we're gonna have to. You know, Mr. Meadows is misinterpreting. Okay, see, Benny Thompson using that language that Jerry ha Jamie Harrison would use. He's not misinterpreting, brother. He has stuck his middle finger up and said, make me. If you ain't going to arrest him, if you're not going to arrest him, you should just probably stop talking and maybe resign or not because y'all not ready to fight these white boys. You, have you forgotten the history of white expansion over the last 500 years? There are no rules. Make me. So Meadows, Meadows is not going to be indicted. Then I mean, they're going to hold him contempt, but they're going to send the police to go get him. Now, because if it was your black ass, they would send the police before you said, I'm not. Oh, what is this? These are handcuffs. And what would you do? Half of y'all will go willingly. Well, all right, we, we have to go in. I'll just let the system work. We'll, we'll trust it. Why y'all keep messing? These white boys. Anyway, so so I brought up Bannon for this reason. Oh, Bannon was vanquished from the White House. Bannon, mm -mm, no. Steve Bannon has continued to work unimpeded. Let me, let me, uh, yes, he has. Me. Let me, let I me said, go. I interviewed him. Um, oh, did you tell yeah. him about that? Would you, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wu Tang, nothing for you know, he, he is the architect. <laughs> we, we had a very interesting conversation because you, you know, behind the scenes. Race is, is, is a tool, is a weapon that is being used. And we talk, you know, we went back and forth whether they hate us or not. Steve Bannon is about his ultimate goal, which is to destroy this entire government and country because he's got an international plan. This is global for him. And the moves and machinations that he's made, and he's very, very wealthy, you know, he's 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 powered things like Breitbart media, you know, he's yes. he's gotten in, he's figured out he's got a little social media thing as well. And now he has this podcast, which is everything, you know, the the, the word coming through the mic into your soul. Uh, he's got an international movement that no one's even checking for. And he realized that the power wasn't in the White House. So he's got his puppet there. And be clear, he was the puppet master. Be clear, he was the puppet. He no was question. not at the behest of Trump. It was the other way around. No question. There's a good book called Devil's Bargain that kind of walks through that. That's right. He rolled him in. And he's very smart because he'll no talk question. about, you know, you know, he'll talk about race in a way that is not so, you know, like we we had, we sparred and I'm sitting there, I'm like, pick, 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 because I picked, you know, to try to see where people come. I was like, he's very dangerous. Yes. So I knew, I knew that. Um, and 
He still is. So he still us, is. So tell us the arrest is not gonna have any no, they ain't they ain't gonna arrest them because these, these people still think they have a and by these people, I mean the good, well-meaning, beloved, thinking, hard working legislators and the federal legislature and all the people in the two-party system, at least the progressives and others, you know, they really believe that they want to believe they know better now. These are not stupid people. They know better, but they will still suspend what they know to be true. But we, don't we all do that though? I mean, you as you're talking, I'm like, there are people right now listening, watching this, who still hold out hope that some better angels will, will somehow, you know, in the oh, answer, we pray, and you know, God, the Lord will provide, and we, you yeah. know, we got all the words. When yeah. we know, we know, we we have experienced 400 years of a thing here, so we yeah. think in our DNA with our own spirit what what the possibilities are. Well, yeah, we, 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 we hold that hope, but that don't mean we act stupidly. I mean, and, know, and, and, with, with all of the flaws. We stupidly in how we support and who we support and what we don't come out against and what we're not, what we sit and take and what we, don't we though? We know, I think, well, put it this way. I think, well, yes, of course. We've lost the momentum of memory. We have no memory. This is one of the, we, that's one of the reasons why as you ground us in narrative and Nubia expands. And it's, that's one of the reasons why we have to have these spaces and this work that we're doing now. And that's one of the reasons why, we, you know, my high school kids in Philly and the students at Howard over the last 20 years, you know, we really developed that's this Africana studies framework because we have to engage in this deep intellectual work to allow us to remember so we can regain the momentum of memory so that legislators today, for example, in the United States Congress or state local legislators, they may not remember for all of his humanity and we're all human beings. So this isn't about who he slept with, what trips he take, how much money did he spend? You know, did he leave his first wife or his second wife and all the, but just in terms of legislative impact, an ability to seize a moment when you have a crack and then create a crack if there is not one, you know, I'm not at all convinced that the legislators now who comprise, say, for example, the Congressional Black Caucus has done nearly enough study of the career of Adam Clayton Powell. Mm. I mean, to understand someone who will have the hope, will play the role, but who knew, I mean, if you, if you know, and with all due respect to Robert Cairo and his incredible work on Lyndon Baines Johnson, and uh, if you read Jervis Anderson's work on Adam Clayton Powell, you read Adam Clayton Powell himself. Yes. You know, what you see is this is a man who understood how to use power. And okay. so when you look at the Biden, the one point two you know, billion a trillion dollar act is out and a lot of that Pell Grant's going to be expanded. And, you know, the HBCUs, of course, 75 uh, percent of the students who attend historically black college universities in the United States of America are Pell Grant eligible. I myself was Pell Grant eligible and had the Pell Grant um, and that almost 40 percent of all undergraduates in the United States ha are Pell Grant eligible. You have you know, have to think, you know who you have to thank for that? Adam Clayton Powell. <laughs> Powell knew how Powell was no fool. Let me ask you a question. Uh, mm -hmm. One that uh, I have pondered for quite some time because I've read uh, Adam by Adam. And uh, yes, you have, we talked about that early okay. on. That's right. His white skin. His white, oh. you know, so, you know, he would do things like bring, bring black people into the segregated uh, you know, dining hall and just in his boldness with understanding white privilege. Mm -hmm. he, he, you, he absolutely used white privilege yes, in the did. spaces to get the things done, which I no disrespect. No, but he couldn't have done it as a dark skinned man. I don't believe he could have wielded the same level of power because white people, the, the whole notion of passing is insane when you think about it, right? Because we all know we can look at people and like Bob Barr is black. Stop it, but Babe Ruth is black. Y'all don't we see it, we see it. We, we know because the one of the one of the stories I always tell is how Ty Cobb used to call him the N-word from the Detroit Lions dugout across to the Yankees dugout. No question. You know, we know, <laughs> we know. I mean, wrote me a beer and I, I held a picture up for my class. I said, Is this a black oh. man? I did this uh yesterday. Yesterday they really yeah, and I said, because, you know, we, we were talking about passing. Yeah. Uh, not one person thought he was black. That's well, crazy. So why do you think he thinks he's black? Why do you think he's black in America? And one kid was like, well, he, he was in Harlem, so maybe, you know, he adopted the culture. Like, they're not even understanding the power of, of how whiteness has become this. And, and I think even white folk will fool themselves that, you know, that a person can pass. You know damn well 
you know, like if you did the one thirty second rule, most of y'all got, well, all of y'all got African. Which everybody. is what Du Bois wrote in 1935. He said, everybody. we got all these, all the, look, Tiny said it in the chat. Ramar Bearden refused to pass coming out of North Carolina. Ramar yeah. Bearden was one of the blackest human beings to ever, <laughs> as we know. So none, but none of them, because they don't have any context for it. But that's, that's kind of striking though. That because Ramar Bearden could be in most of our families. We have Ramar Bearden's. Yes. I wonder if you had showed him a video and he had talked. Well, if he had talked, there's another thing. But <laughs> you know, the visual. Yeah, the eyeball know, test. No that's question. Why the microphone is so powerful, you know. Yeah, that's that, right. That, that's true, sir, or not. But you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Adam Clayton Powell. He walked through the world like a white man with that kind of, you know, he. Yeah, he did. Even though he, you know, he, he was there rent striking and, you know, br bringing all of the rights for black people. When he walked into Congress, it was with a boldness that was like, it was almost like a superpower because he still had that white skin and he's able to get in these people's faces. That's and it's hard true. for them to look at him and not see themselves. That's Just very true. That's so, a very, no, that's a very good point. You know, it's interesting. Um, thinking about that attitude which is very pal specific, but also pal specific as a representative of this, the governance structures of African people with that pulpit at Abyssinian, with his father, who we've talked about, I'm playing pal senior, with that momentum of self-determination coming out of that uh, very class inclusive, because you have some of the quote unquote upper class, relatively speaking, black folk at Abyssinian. You got working folk class folk at Abyssinian. It's in Harlem. He never has to worry about his elections or re-elections. He saw himself as black America's congressperson. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that kind of attitude, I'm not going to say, and I'm just now reflecting on the first people of African descent to come into the United States federal legislature in the 1860s yes. and 70s of course the, the the people who have been written about a great deal and there's been some incredible research and there's stuff coming out all the time but i would of course lead with the older stuff which may not have had access to all of the things that are being revealed in archives but had the the feel the sense the interpretive frame that is yet to be surpassed the writing of du bois uh, the writing of Lerone Bennett Jr. in Black Power USA, the Robert Elliott's, the Robert Smalls, those those uh, those Reconstruction era. That attitude is there because these cats had felt the lash, mm -hmm. and they had come out of some of them had moved from state legislatures to federal legislatures, and that isn't to say they weren't with they weren't without un uncomplicated they they weren't. This isn't to say that they didn't have uncomplicated politics. When you look at the career, for example, of John Mercer Langston. Uh, who was, the, for all intents and purposes, the he was the president of Howard University for almost two years, he had an interim title, and they wouldn't make him the permanent president. So he resigns from the university, founded dean of the law school, um, but goes back to his home, Virginia, and comes back to the United States uh, uh, Congress as a congressperson who had come through enslavement. It's a different attitude. So by the time you get to George White in 1901, that first couple of waves of black representatives in the federal legislature have that, either at the state level, Local level, federal level. You got cats like Henry Menil Turner and them, you know, and these parenthetically, a guy like Turner and um, my man Andre Johnson's book, No Future in This Country, uh, collects a lot of Turner's work. In fact, he's done a number of works. So he's down at the University of Memphis. Um, but he, I would encourage people, Edwin Red Key's book, Respect Black, the speeches and writings of Henry Menil Turner. Um, anyway, I, but, but Turner is, there's a lot of stuff on Turner. But yeah, that attitude, you don't see even in uh cats like mitchell in fact there's a brand new book on uh mitchell out of chicago and oscar the priest that's mm. when you see him fl flip from republican to democrat safe black district um but at any rate but pal i think you're right pal but pal k, k kennedy in the chat said it was is, is that a trojan horse and you think about, you know, Trojan horse uh, method uh, to, to come in. And I think about, you know, Powell, you you know, you bring up even Elaine Brown, uh, you know, ch uh, church, Robert Church could pass, no you know, question. you know, so you, you, 
<laughs> you know, pe white people get confused because whiteness is a construct. They don't even understand it. They don't even understand it. So you you see a Robert Church senior, you're confused, you know, and he's able to do so much. That's you know, true. Mary Ellen Pleasant. I mean, you think about a lot of these uh, early folk who are able to move the needle, um, whether it's financial or otherwise, a lot of them could pass. Even Homer Plessy. You know, you oh, think Homer about Homer Plessy was was in in many ways that was that was that setup was built around Plessy's capacity ability to pass. Because he was able to buy that ticket and get in that car because they thought he was a white man, which for all intents and purposes, one eighth black. Like you said, the one drop rule, that's what get, let Plessy get in the game. No question. No question. No question. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that Powell is able to move differently because of the way he presents biologically race as biology. And. But that notwithstanding the point that you were making about people studying him, I think you're absolutely right. I think people study the bravado. They study the, you know, black is beautiful, baby. They, they, they study all of, you know, all of, you know, the, 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 the backstory and the front story and all of the ancillary. Cause he was a hot ass mess on some level. He would be oh, no so question. Fun today. Uh, but he didn't give a F though about it. No. And, and, and as it related to his people, he was in the paint going hard. I was in the paint. Time. And those those things, those methodologies, the, the the boldness of that, we we still see people playing nice, like Jamie Harrison and others, like still trying to play nice with folk who have a mission. The fact that that judge could do that, the fact that Steve Bannon that is so like they are telling you to your face what the plan is, and they got a plan because you don't you don't you don't get that public with your racism unless you are confident that something is coming behind it. No question, no question. I mean. Schroeder to Bannon, and I see whether you agree with this. It's a rough compare. I'm, I'm trying to think of my that would be like a high school bully to a Harvard political scientist. Mm -hmm. Or or no, a political scientist at Oxford or Cambridge, because you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Steve Bannon is a white internationalist, he's not a white nationalist. Steve Bannon, like you said, the United States of America is really an afterthought for Steve Bannon. And that, he doesn't care if it goes away. No, he doesn't. No, in fact. He wants it to. He said that out of his mouth. No question. In fact, the only time I've ever seen Steve Bannon in person, I was in a bookstore that is going out of business, like many of these rare and used bookstores, on Capitol Hill, maybe about five blocks from the Supreme Court. And I would go in there regularly. And, you know, most of the bookstores pre-COVID and even now, if I were to go, if I were to, go to a place I've been in since COVID, they know me by name because I'm one of the few black people that be in those places. And so I was in there one day and I, yeah, I go in a store like that. I might spend a couple of hours because I'm going to go every shelf, every book. Now you go to the black section. No, I don't even start the black section. <laughs> I'm going, just going all the sections because what you'll find in, in, and you all know this, and I'm loving how people are communicating now, Nubia and putting on social media that they're finding these books. I mean, yeah, go in every section in the used bookstore because if you're looking for the black stuff in the black section, nah, go in the architecture section and then you find, oh, what is this? Oh, houses in Mali. Oh, traditional African house. Oh, wow. Oh, here's a book on Paul Revere Williams. What is that doing? He was a black architect who designed houses for the stars, including Sinatra and them in LA, but it ain't going to be in the black study section. Often it'll be in the architecture section. No, you got to go. Anyway, I was in there and I came to the uh, counter to check out and, you know, I had a stack of books or whatever, and they know me in there. And there's a young white girl checking us out. Steve Bannon was in front of me. And he had a stack of books. He checked out and then I, then I said, that's what I think it was, wasn't it? She said, yeah, he's in there all the time. I said, figures. Then we just started laughing. Steve, you're right. Steve Bannon is no dummy. Mm -mm. He's rich. He's always reading. And if you get up in his face about race or something like that, he, he will probably embarrass you by knowing more about what you're talking about than you know. <laughs> And then connected to something you don't know nothing about. You know, if you're going to fight a cat like Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon looking at Donald Trump, like, as you said, you're just basically a meat package that I'm going to deliver a message through. And these people think I care about this job. No, because in fact, let me leave. Why? Because I'm about to mess up. I'm a little too visible right now. And I'll, like you said, uh, look, this is yesterday's New York Times. Let me, let me indulge you for a second. Here we go. 
This Dateline Brasilia. Y'all know Brasilia. That's Brazil. Big city in Brazil. The conference hall was packed with a crowd of more than 1,000 cheering attacks on the press, the liberals, and the politically correct. There was Donald Trump Jr. warning that the Chinese could meddle in the election, a Tennessee congressman who voted against certifying the 2020 vote, and the president complaining about voter fraud. In many ways, the September gathering looked like just another CPAC, the conservative political Brazil conference. But it was happening in Brazil. Most of it was in Portuguese. And the president at the lectern was Jair Bolonzaro, the country's right wing leader, fresh from their assault on the results of the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Former President Donald J. Trump and his allies are exporting their strategy to Latin America's largest democracy. Working to support Mr. Bolonzaro's bid for re-election next year and helping sow doubt in the electoral process in the event he, that he loses. They are branding his political rivals as criminals and communists, building, who that is, building new social networks where he can avoid Silicon Valley's rules against misinformation and amplifying his claims that the election in Brazil will be rigged. Goes on. My point is this. What you raised about Steve Bannon is absolutely correct. Nobody hits my door at 730 in the morning. Sure, come on. I, sh I should probably check that. Should we pause? Let's pause. No, let's just pause just for a second. Let me see who that is. Because right. nobody hits my door like that. Yeah. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. Just, I hope everything's okay. Let me come in. Hold on. Just keep going. You good. Hold I will. I will. I will. Okay. Let me go into the chat too. Because I'm I was micro, I was managing a bunch of stuff at the same time. So I'm gonna go back to the chat and let me call up. And I had to find the daggone stream that we were on. Do 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 do. All right, family. All right, let me come in myself to stream hi let me take him out of stream hi so go lay out on me Do -do -do. okay all right uh, as we wait for dr carr to come back from the door um this notion that uh we're in this space right now with with um with the bold racism and shout out to tanya who's in panama chilling uh hopefully preparing a way i think we should start to contemplate and at least plan for yes we're going to stay and fight but we should at least plan for the inevitable because I feel like uh, they're on to something and Dr. Carr is back. All right. Let me go. Hi. Okay. Unmute. 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 Okay. Anything good? Keep going. Yeah, that was, uh, that's so funny. They be working the, uh, the you know what, out of um, these postal workers. At 730 in the morning? Yeah, but this was, uh, this was one of the brothers on the roof. It's usually a sister and... I know yeah, you know them too. I know you. This one of the brothers who is this the book? Is this a book, Dr. Carr? Of course. <laughs> he wasn't gonna, he was he know me. So half the time, so I said, Man, you're early. He said, I got a lot of packages today. I did you first. This is oh. my man. See, this is the beautiful thing about it. National treasure. Yeah, you know, well, you know, Kwame Ture used to say this, Tony Carmichael used to always say this. When you take care of the people, the people take care of you. Right. And I'm going to tell y'all a story that, I mean, it's not real, real quick. This is a 30 second story. My man, uh, Wayne, who is the UPS guy on this route, has been for several years. Um, they sent me a copy of Make Good the Promise, which is the companion book to the new exhibit at the Museum of African History and Culture. Because, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, the yeah. panel that they did a couple of weeks ago. And he brought the book. And say, hold on, man, hold on, I'm gonna show you this book. So I was showing it to him. Me and him talk, you know, good brother, because he during COVID, man, I'm worried about your brother, because you know UPS. In fact, there's a book, there's a book on UPS. It talks about the United Parcel Service and the oppressive regime that it treats its workers. You know, Amazon, one thing, UPS. You know, those of you who are old enough to remember, and I'm sure you remember this, Professor Hunter, when you know we were in college, UPS job was a good job, but they worked the shit you. I have friends. <laughs> Right, no question, because they would come back to the dorm with horror stories, but they paid well, you know, if you could survive. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but anyway, so Wayne brings me the book, it's in the package. I know what it is. I open it up, I show it to him, tell him about it. So, we were doing a prep meeting for the uh, for the panel, and we were talking, and I told him, you know, man, I told him, I was so excited to get this by show, Wayne. So my friend Kinshasa Conwell, who is the deputy director of the museum, just a beautiful, beautiful spirit and sister, brilliant sister. She was like, oh, we got to get him a copy. See, those are the black people 
that you want in administrative positions, that you want in leadership, who recognize that the difference between any of us is just the job we do. But in terms of a governance structure, yeah, so they, so this brother was not going to leave my book. <laughs> he was gonna hit. He was gonna hit that bell till the cows come home because he figured he got to be there. It's too early for him not to be anywhere. So, but anyway, so thank you. I just want you know that, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. can we see the book? Can, we should probably oh. do like book reveal every week. Doctor Carr, what did Doctor? We could. Carr we could. Say? We could. We could. Okay, hold on. All right. Hold on. What's in the package today? Hold on. Yes, this is uh, Robert Levine's new book, The Failed Promise. Reconstruction, Frederick Douglass, and the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Levine is, uh, and I was hoping, but I got, anyway, that's a whole nother thing. I got some cats in Cali that I just got some journals I've been looking for that came in. Robert Levine is an interesting guy. He's actually kind of low. He's University of Maryland College Park. He writes all the time. And he's talking about, he's doing a, a reassessment of Andrew Johnson. Mm. And he's he's looking at Johnson through the lens of two figures that he has written a lot about. Frederick Douglass, one, and my man, the hero of every story in this period, as far as I'm concerned, in some ways, uh, Martin Delaney. And the thing that I am always, the thing I learned least from most white, and to be fair, black writers about this period when they write about Delaney, they write from a social structure sensibility. And that's not a critique. I don't expect them not to, because the only people who believe in this fantasy more than certain black people who have moved into a place where it really would cost them their job or their livelihood if they didn't are these white people. And so they write with great attention to the archives and detail. I read these books to see if there are any new sources I'm not aware of, that kind of thing. But then they drive more often than not the whole scrutiny of these documents into a ditch. Let me see. Let's test that thesis. Now I'm y'all. Y'all seeing this the same time I am. Real time. Yeah. So let's see. Part one: Douglas Johnson Lincoln. Prologue: Lincoln's second inauguration, Southern Unionist, mission of the war. Abraham Lincoln dies. The Republic lives. Part two: Reconstructions. There is no such thing as Reconstruction. The Moses in the White House. The Black delegation visits the Moses of their people. Part three: Chaos and resistance. Presidents riots, shadowing Johnson, defying the loyalist sources of danger to the Republic. Part four: Final part: Impeachment in black and white. A job offer. The trials of impeachment. The minute Moses of Tennessee. Epilogue: We have a fight on our hands. Okay, so it's a, it's the a movement in four parts. How do we know a social structure? Well, how do we assume that we test it by reading it? All the parts, you got Johnson in a... The first thing is you've put Johnson, Douglas, and Delaney in conversation with each other. Even in black and white, a job offered So job. my assumption is, and I will test this assumption now, we've got to read it, that the framework is going to co-mingle the social structure and the governance structure, which Levine would not use that language. That's why I had to have a black, we had to have black studies framework an Africana states framework, because by blurring the distinction between the social structure and the, and the governance structure, you can try to use this intellectual work to burnish what will eventually be your case to be made to continue this settler project. Now, this is complete speculation, but it's speculation based on experience. But let's let's just fin let's just finish this for a minute. So I'm looking at the way that this is set up. So let me go to the end because I what what, I, what I'm really looking for in this book is fresh ideas and sources and evaluation of Andrew Johnson. I was going to ask you, why would you buy that? Yeah, that well, we all, well, first of all, you know, I'm an inveterate. That's why I'm, you know, I, I stay broke. But the whole point is that the, you gotta, you gotta have it. In other words, I don't believe in people talking about stuff they don't know nothing about. So people say, you know, I, I want to be able, because the other thing is, as John Henry Clark used to always say, some stories, it ain't no good guys. These are all human beings. So would I have been trying to kill Andrew Johnson if I was enslaved by him prior to the Civil War? I like to believe that I would have. Uh, would I have been busting my ass on any property that Johnson had an interest in or control uh, as an enslaved person? I know that I would not have. Um, I would have been doing enough not to get beat or not to get disciplined or whatever, but I'm not killing myself. And when the Civil War jumped off, would I have been looking to roll? Yeah, hell yeah. My point is it. So I don't know that, you know, but anyway, 
let me go to the end here. I want to see what he does. Let's look at the last. Okay, here we go. This is this is page 234 and 235. I haven't read this, but in terms of looking at a book, you got five minutes in a bookstore and you're trying to decide whether to buy a book, look at the table of contents, go through the index, because the more you read, the more you're looking for what's not in here. So you're looking through, right? And then, of course, you've already read, I've already read the primary documents, many of them, they're that good volume on Reconstruction, where you see them meeting with Johnson at the White House, and you see Johnson telling these black people to calm y'all ass down, and you're seeing the arguments back and forth. So I have all those primary documents in my head. Now I want to see what Levine is going to do with those. But at the end here, he says, Andrew Johnson, he says, Douglas has a more prophetic and inspirational role in this story. Nearly 30 years after the inauguration of Andrew Johnson, Reconstruction remained for Douglas less a failed promise than an unfulfilled promise. It remains unfulfilled to this day. See, there you go. Less a failed promise than an unfulfilled promise. Levine is a good enough scholar to know they can't say that Re Reconstruction remained for Douglas, not a failed promise, but an unfulfilled promise because Douglas was raining holy hell fire on them before he made transition in 1895. So he can't say that he didn't think it was failed. He's less a failed promise than an unfulfilled promise. That's an evaluation of Douglas's trajectory. It's really using the sources to help Douglas help you keep your settler project alive, followed by the sentence, it remains unfulfilled to this day. As if that's some kind of revelation. Black people have been taking uninterrupted ass whipping since the first boat came up. It remains unfulfilled to this day. What's unfulfilled? Now, Contrast that with uh, Fred Douglas. And again, now, what we're seeing here, this is what, like, on office hours, that's one of the reasons when we did office hours, I was like, we could do this. Oh, I don't have my copy of Make Good the Promise, the, the Reconstruction joint that just came out. Oh, wow, I don't know what I did with it. I moved it because I was doing something else. And Anyway, Douglas, there's a quote in the exhibit that's reproduced in the book at the Museum, National Museum of African Culture. Frederick Douglass gives a speech, and in the speech, he asks this question. Um, will you make good the promise in your constitution? He didn't say our constitution? No, he said your constitution. Douglass is clear that whatever is being built now ain't what it was. And I'm not in. And then he, and in another place, I mean, Douglas gave so many speeches, thousands of speeches, all these papers. You can get Eric Foner's five volumes, John Blassing games, the Frederick Douglass papers. You, you see Douglas, Douglas is a master of language. So when Douglas says something like, um, for example, um, fellow citizens, why have you called me here today? This 4th of July is yours, not mine. And he goes through, he said, now in order to make it mine, this is going to have to be different. Now he's going to, you know, give other language where he's much more conciliatory. But even when they dedicate that Lincoln statue, the one that they were talking about taking down here in D.C., the first public memorial to Lincoln. And, and, and President Grant is there. Several justices of the Supreme Court was there. And Fred Douglas is called on to speak. And he gets up with a verbal machine gun and murders everything moving on the podium <laughs> the judges the president and he says and lincoln was not a great man i knew lincoln he said but you know he was your president he was not our president oh now i'm sure levine he know that he gonna go. so when he gets to the end he's saying oh yeah you know it remains unfulfilled there has been progress along the ascending spiral curve that is racial relations in the united states but the struggle remains a fundamental challenge facing a nation that was built on slavery. Okay, footnote. He takes he takes the phrase ascending spiral curve and puts it in quotes. That's because that's taken from Douglas. But that concept that history moves in progression, ever, ever, ever upward, even a straight line or even as a spiral, it takes dips, but it's going this way. I go back to my man, the great Jacob Hudson Carruthers, his 1972 essay, Science and Depression, where he says, this is how the West works. The West has constructed a theory of perpetual progress with itself as the driving engine of human progress. And whenever you experience something different than that, they have a reserve theory of progress in their back pocket to put on you to make you think, if the thing, the thing, no, the thing ain't going backward. 
So this is the thing you find in every Ken Burns documentary in books like this, apparently, because we just read this. In other words, I know you took an ass whooping, but it's better than it was, isn't it? <laughs> but behind that is the assumption that no matter how far back you go, it was worse than today, which means everything that happened before the boats came, well, that's just some bullshit which is the reinforcing of the deep structural racism of white supremacy. Because the notion is there's nobody in the world that ever did it better than white people. And that you have been brought into something that is terribly flawed, is very difficult, but just hang with us here while we finish poisoning the air. Hang with us here while we perfect the rockets to leave your black ass here. Chris, hang with, well, not you, because I like the way you look, sis, so you come with us, man. But the rest of you niggas gonna die. Now, just hang with us. Long enough for the, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just hang with us. We will pay you $100 million to dribble the basketball and throw it through a net as long as I'm the owner and I made $10 billion last year and it's just a toy. I sit up in the suites and watch it like, just hang with us because it's, I know somebody else got killed and yes, I know they're going to let the white boy in Kenosha go and yes, I know them people in Georgia talking crazy, but just hang with us. So anyway, Levine says, there's been a progress along an ascending spiral curve. And by the way, if you say, oh, no, this is not good. They got a reserve theory of progress, which implies mm -hmm. you could have left your black ass in Afro Africa with mumbo jumbo God of the Congo and all them other gods of the Congo. You know, boom, 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 boom. Go see Vachelle Lindsay's poem, The Congo. Mumbo jumbo God of the Congo. In other words, the, uh, the, the implied statement is y'all was in Africa killing each other. And yes, slavery was terrible. But look at you now. Gucci down to the socks. Look at you now. You started from the bottom. Now we here. So look at you now. Anyway, and stop complaining. I mean, you know, anyway, so he goes on and says, Andrew Johnson was not unique. There would be more Johnsons to come, and Douglas knew that. But Douglas and his, with his determination to persist in the effort to achieve the promise of Reconstruction, continu continues to appeal to what Lincoln, here we go. Remember? Now I ain't read this yet. I got to confirm it. Part one, Douglas Johnson Lincoln, prologue, Lincoln's second inauguration. He returns to it at the end of the page. So I got to see what he says at the beginning. He says, but Douglas, with his determination to persist in the course of the chief of problems of reconstruction, continues to appeal to what Lincoln in his first inaugural address called the better angels of our nature. There are moments when Douglas is so eloquent, prescient, and wise that the best we can do is listen without comment. Okay, to me, I read that as that's the concession. Mm -hmm. That's the concession. You know what it is, Brother Levine. And I ain't mad at you. This your country. Your people immigrated over here. Maybe they were pushed out of wherever they came from in Europe. Maybe they were pulled by economic promise. But I tell you what, they weren't. What? Chained in the bottom of a damn boat. Anyway, let's continue. In this story of the failed promise of reconstruction, Douglas gets the last word. Here's a short excerpt from the end of his 1894 anti-lynching lecture, where he seen, which he seems to have written with 21st century Americans in mind. Now you got him speaking to the future. We need to listen, and then we need to resume Douglas's struggle because it remains our own. He gives Douglas the last word. Very good. This is Fred Douglas. Put away your race prejudice. Banish the idea that one class must rule over another. Recognize the fact that the rights of the humblest citizen are as worthy as protection as those of the highest, and your problem will be solved. And whatever may be in store for it in the future, whether prosperity or adversity, whether it shall have foes without or foes within, whether there shall be peace or war based upon the eternal principles of true justice and humanity, and with no class having any cause or complaint or grievance, your republic will stand and flourish forever. Again, the use of your. This, this is a year before he dies. But also notice the nationalist strain in there. We're going to tie this to Steve Bannon. Now, let's pause here for a second and reflect that if we didn't have Nubia, we didn't have narrative. If we hadn't been doing in class for 88 weeks in a row, that 10 times out of 10, I would be sitting here with what's coming out of my mouth, never leaving my mouth. It would be in my mind because I'd be reading this, thinking about this. And if those are young people, if you don't have teachers who are constantly absorbing content so they can help you develop your own ideas by introducing you to content, not telling you what to think at all, but showing you where stuff is and then getting out of your way so that you can read it and then come back and have a conversation, then you need to ask that person, why did you go into the teaching profession? Oh. <laughs> because you, you're you not helping me. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I, I set out to say this. It's interesting that he closes with Douglas being somewhat ambigu ambiguous, but 
as we're talking about Steve Bannon, it makes me think about this because Bannon's a nationalist, but he's an internationalist. Douglas, Levine uses Douglas to emphasize this notion of commitment to this nation state project called the United States of America. Now, what I, the other reason I'll put this down, the other reason I think is very important that we had this conversation is that, now let me look, because see, Levine wrote a book on Douglas and Delaney. Now I'm going to look in the index for Martin Delaney. Martin R. Delaney is written about page 31, advocating black immigration, black nationalism of Delaney, page XX, Roman numeral 20, page 98, seeing Johnson as a symptom, page 227, thinking Johnson not that bad, page XVI, writing to Johnson about enfranchisement, 115, seeing Johnson not that bad. Let me just go to one, page 227, and I'll tell you why I'm going to do it in about 45 seconds, 227. Let me see what he says here about Martin Delaney. It was 227, isn't it? Yeah, page 227. Okay, here we go. Uh, Levine writes, I mean not to defend Johnson, but rather to call attention to the differing perspectives of African-Americans. Francis Harper, George T. Downing, Martin Delaney, Douglas, the writers for the Christian Recorder and other African-American newspapers and the participants at black conventions all considered Johnson in the larger context of the history of slavery and racism in the United States. In their view, Johnson was a symptom of endemic national problems that would not quickly go away. Let me pause here. This book is about Douglas and Johnson, not Delaney and Johnson. But if you're not careful, this question of emphasis, my question would be, what was everybody else saying? And typically for this period, for this period from the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, until Delaney makes transition in the 80s, if I'm looking for the way we're thinking about governance of African people, I am rarely, if ever, going to consult Frederick Douglass first. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Martin Delaney if I got to pick between the two. Because Delaney was clear. In fact, Douglas is the 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 uh, the uh, the dicta that is attributed to Frederick Douglass. The saying goes: Douglas said, "Every morning I get up and thank God He made me a man." And every morning, Martin Delaney gets up and thanks God He made him a black man. That's the difference between me and Martin Delaney. So I'm saying, I got you, Fred. You the man. Love it. You beat you know Cubby's ass. You got out. Your wife Anna financed the whole thing. She was free. I love it. It's beautiful. You're an incredible scholar, thinker, writer. And if I'm asking about my people first, I'm going to go to your man's. You know, the brother who you work with on the North Star had the Pittsburgh mystery. Yeah, you know that cat that went to Africa and talked to the Alaki of Abiokuta, then came back and was like, I'll be a major. And the, you know the dude you got mad at because Lincoln made him a major and didn't give you the commission. Why? Because Levine speculates in another book that perhaps he gave Delaney the commission because he knew that Delaney would kill Lincoln himself to get free. So he's like, he's like Fred, you know, you, you kill people too, man, but you know, you're a little too polite. Delaney, I have no, I have no doubt. Delaney would stick a knife in my throat. And I'm trying to in the war. I mean, no shade, but I need Martin Delaney on it because Delaney comes to Lincoln and said, look, man, I'm going to tell you to win the war. Give me some of them guns and some uniforms. I'm going to raise some of these brothers and we're going to end this shit. <laughs> you, you know what? Major Delaney. Douglas was <laughs> mad. <laughs> Douglas, I'm not getting the commission. Come on, man. We're trying to win the war. I mean, speeches are good, but this case, now Douglas, two of his sons were in the Grand Army of the Republic. So this is not shade on Douglas, but I'm saying, I'm going to go now. Levine, did not write a book, Delaney and Johnson. He writes a book, Douglas and Johnson. And in the index, he's only referring to Delaney a few times in the book, including two at the very beginning, which means they're in the prologue, which means he's going to frame Delaney. And he didn't quote Delaney on page 227, which was the last substantive reference in the book. He didn't even quote him. He just added him as a string with other people, which leads me then to say, okay, Marianne Shad, what did they think of? Now, now, Again, this is all what they would call, I guess, if you're in, in reading sense, this is all uh, speculative. Mm -hmm. I'm developing a hypothesis based on looking at a few points. Now I'm going to read through the thing and then I'll report back. Right. So anyway, how's that tied to Steve Bannon? Well, <laughs> if you are a nationalist, Jamie Harrison's a nationalist. I'm not talking about white black nationalists, I'm talking about American nationalists. These are the people who think that the artificial lines drawn on the maps in the world mean something, either to the environment, which is clear it doesn't, or to the people living within those lines, and that the concept of nation state absolutely relies on making the fiction of the nation 
stand up. It's easier when you have some cultural homogeneity. So when you look at the amount of money that is spent in the Scandinavian countries, in the in the more culturally homogenous countries toward, for example, early childhood education, and then you come to the United States and they spend less than five hundred dollars per child. You ask yourself, why is that the case? Because this ain't no nation. This is not it's not culturally homogenous. Nation means you got common language, common memories coming. This is a car crash of settler colonialism. Uh, and they're constantly trying to reinforce. I mean, let's pause for a second and go back to the heart of they fall just for a second and put it in the context of the way James Baldwin writes about Westerns and, and the way that Raoul Peck takes those Baldwin quotes out and puts them in his film and the companion book, I Am Not Your Negro. When Baldwin says, it's, it's crazy when you go to the movies and then you get a little older and you realize that you went in there rooting for Gary, Gary Cooper against the Indians. And then you realize the Indians are us. And so, wait, yeah, I mean, because what is all, in fact, there's a new book called, oh uh, man, come on, son. Do I have it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. There's a new book. This is Kevin Brunel's book called Settler Memory. The Disavowal of Ind Indigeneity and the Politics of Race in the United States. It's an interesting kind. Br Brunet, uh, Brunel is a professor at Babson College. He writes a whole book on how the erasure of indigenous people is the prerequisite for building this national identity, including, here's chapter three, James Baldwin and the Cowboys and Indians. In fact, let's just let Baldwin speak for himself. He says... There used to be an old joke going around among Negroes. If you remember the Lone Ranger, shout out, by the way, to Bass Reeves, the, the man who, and Uraeus was writing office hours on Monday. It's really, you can't compare. They say, oh, Bass Reeves, and I said that too. You know, Bass Reeves is like the, 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 the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. Yeah, but like Uraeus said Monday, you can't pour Bass Reeves. The Lone Ranger, he quickly overflows. Uh, the Long Ranger. My man James Morgan has written about this. And there's another uh, movie that came out a couple of years ago. In fact, the brother came to Howard and showed it about Bass Reeves. And of course, Delroy Lindo. Uh, was it Mike? I think Michael Harriet tweeted this out or something. He said, you know, can we all just establish that the way that you live in a, in life, if you will all come to a good uh, outcome, if you just simply do whatever Delroy Lindo tells you to do. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it was Mike Harry. Was it? I had to give Mike. Uh, Mike, that was uh, that was like yes, brother. Just do it, do it, Daryl Lindo, and you will live to the end. Of the so anyway, so uh, Baldwin says there used to be an old joke going around among Negroes. If you remember the Lone Ranger, uh, I think he had a sidekick called Tonto, an Indian. There's always a good Indian. He rode around it with the Lone Ranger, and according to my version of the story, the version I heard, Tonto and the Lone Ranger ran into this ambush of nothing but Indians. The Lone Ranger said. What are we going to do, Tonto? And Tonto said, what do you mean we? Well, <laughs> I tell that joke in order to point out something else. It's a Negro joke. One of the other things we did in order to conquer the country, physically speaking, was to enslave the Africans. He goes on, and then he's writing about how the joke turns on the question of who constitutes the we. Now, when you look at a film like The Heart of They Fall, and we talked about this in Office Hours a little bit, but just for the folk who are not yet there, um, you think about the erasure of the Indians. Yeah, I know one of the guys is part Indian and they took the names and stuck them on. We're not talking about historical figures. We all understand that stagecoach Mary is not laying what she looked like. That's not, we're going to set that aside because we know this is cultural meaning making and that's fine, you know, for whatever it does, it doesn't do. I'm talking now about the question of the master narrative. And when you look at the heart of they fall, you understand that as long as there have been motion pictures, black people been making Westerns. You go back to Oscar Michaud, look at Michaud's work. The, the, the movies he made based on the novels, The Unconquered, The Homesteader. I mean, these are basically settler expansion stories, but he's talking about immigration. Uh, what's the one? Within these gates. He's talking about all black towns, all this kind of stuff. It's 1920s and 30s. And then, so, then when you come forward, you know that there was also a whole, uh, what was it? Harlem Rides the Range. That was one. Um, Oh, Harlem Rise the Range was one. There were these movies in the 1930s, 39, Bronze Buckaroo. Uh, Harlem Rise the Range. What is Harlem Rise the Range? Um, Harlem on the Prairie. These are the 30s. So we constantly, what is this? In, in fact, those movies start, go look this brother up. There's, in fact, there's a book on him. Uh, Scarecrow Press, I think, out of New Jersey. Was it Scarecrow or was it? 
Quentin Miller. Anyway, I'll never be able to find it. I know I have it here. It's not in storage. It's some Herb Jeffries, the singing cowboy. Go look at him in the 1930s. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying anything people don't already know, but I just want to make this point. Every Western black people made reflects the time they made it. That's the, that's the cultural meaning making category. In other words, when you see a black Western, so to speak, you're not just looking at the subject. You're looking at the moment the imagination of that subject uh, appeared, which reflects a more broad, a, a broader market sensibility. So when Michaud is making movies, this is right after Birth of a Nation. So what you see him dealing with, he's dealing with colorism. He's dealing with class issues. He's not really dealing with Native Americans. He's dealing with class issues, black and white. You got poor whites out there on the prairie. It's kind of thing. So you don't really see the Native American motif in there as such. Um, Oscar Michaud and his films is a great book on this. Uh, there's also a documentary that Clyde Taylor did, the great Clyde Taylor. Um, Midnight Lightning is the name of it. Uh, I think Tony K. Bambara had something to do with that. But anyway, on, on Oscar Michaud, I encourage y'all to look up Oscar Michaud. The one Oscar Michaud and his films, Indiana University Press. But um, come forward into the 1930s, those movies are in the 30s. 1938, 39, that's The Wizard of Oz. That's Gone with the Wind. The big cinematic over thing. You got people singing. You got Esther Phillips swimming in the pool. So if Negroes are in movies at that moment, you're going to see them singing and dancing. And so you're really not going to see an emphasis on the politics. Now, you come forward to the 70s, those are the black westerns that we all remember. Buck and the Preacher, which is some people's favorite. Like you raised that, that's his favorite film. Thomasine and Bushrod, a black woman and black man taken from the rich. And like in the heart of the, uh, the heart of the, uh, fall, they go in and rob the white. You know, I mean, it's over the top in terms of a basically cookie cutter, two dimensional representation of whiteness. And then they take the money and they're going to trade it for, you know, stagecoach Mary, this kind of thing. But in Thomasine and Bushrod, this black woman and man, Max Julian, y'all remember, the, I mean, Max Julian is the lead, and uh, what's the sister's name? Oh, uh, not Gloria Foster, who would, some one of those early 1970s black women who weren't leads in many of these black movies, not Gloria Foster. Let me see if Tanya knows during that. Tanya would know, off the top of her head. Uh, Tom Cena and Bushrod. Anyway, it'll come to me in a minute if it doesn't come to somebody in the chat and we can monitor the chat. But uh, oh yeah, Black Rose, White Justice. No question. Uh, in fact, <laughs> that, that I thought about Black Rose, White Justice when uh, Bruce Wright ju when I thought about uh, Schroeder. Bruce Schroeder. Man, Max Julian. Y'all remember him. Yeah, Max Julian. Let me see. Uh, oh yeah, Buck and the Preacher. Right. Right. Boris is saying, I still remember my grandfather taking me to see Buck and the Preacher and he explained that he kept his pistol in his Bible. Yes. Thank you, Julie, for putting Vanetta. that in. That's right. Vanetta That's McGee. right. Charles Music. Vanetta McGee. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. That's it. Vanetta McGee. No question. And she was confused with Lynette McKee. It's Vanetta McGee and Lynette McKee. It's, it's Lynette. Lynette. Isn't it's it Lynette? Lynette? It's Vanetta. No, it's Vanetta. All right. It's they there's a battle right now. Between there's a battle between Vanetta. the McGees. We have to look at it. Okay. McGee, McGee, we know. Yes. Okay. I think Vanette, but anyway, the the point is that if you, and those of you you know Thomasina Bushrod, they're taking money and they are redistributing it in a multi-ethnic context: Native Americans, blacks, formerly enslaved, and then some poor whites. In other words, the West is imagined during this period of Black Power. This is the Black Power movement we're talking about now as an anti-imperial project, even in the movies that would be typified as black exploitation. Remember the year before Thomasina, no, Thomasina Bushrod was 1974. In 1972 was Bucking the Preacher, and then you get the man, the hammer, Fred Williamson. Remember the legend of N-Word Charlie? The legend, of, and then the soul of N-Word Charlie. That's 1972, 1973, 1974. Uh, there's a there's one that he does called Boss N word. Now they just call it Boss because you can't say the N word. This is a brother. Two cats come into town. These brothers, the brother and his sidekick, they take over the whole town, become the sheriff and the deputy. In fact, oh well, anyway, y'all had to look look up right. look up the trail. I'm gonna get correct. It was Vanetta McGee and Thomasine and Bushrod. Very good. Very good. It was Vanetta, not Vanetta. Vanetta. It was Vanetta. Vanetta. Very good. Vanetta McGee. Okay. Yes. So I mean, and again. I'm not critiquing the harder they fall. I'm saying that that's cultural meaning making in this moment. But what you see in those movies in the 70s, they aren't, they aren't taking the names of historical figures and kind of using them to play with. They are creating fictional characters, but what they are doing, and this moves us a little bit to the movement and memory category. They're using those figures to talk about themes of black self-determination that do come 
from the 19th century and early 20th century. Bill Cosby, remember the movie Man and Boy? Man and Boy. Look at Bill. Co I mean, these are these are Western based movies. And of course, there's Jim Brown, who is not coming that route. Pretty much. There's one he does, I think. Take a hard ride, maybe the one. But remember, remember when Jim Brown stopped playing football? Mm -hmm. Jim Brown was on the set. I think it was 100 Rifles. Was it 100 Rifles? I don't remember. It's 68, 69. And uh, Art, whatever his name is, who owned the Browns? Art uh, Modell. Art, Art Mordell yeah. is like, hey, man, training camp. Let's go. Jim Brown was like, uh, I'm on the set. Uh, I'll be there in a minute. I just need to finish filming. Art Mordell's like, this is your job. Jim Brown was like, <laughs> I quit. Now, Jim Brown <laughs> gives a lot of things, but I'm just saying, I think it was a, that was one of the Westerns he was making. My point is this. Of course, you can fast forward. You can talk about Posse, 1993, come forward. But when we look at this concept of the nation, what the point that is made in this book, in uh, in Brunel's book, Settler Memory, is that the erasure of the indigenous people is a prerequisite to creating the nation state that we're in now, even though the benefits of nation state don't accrue to everybody, including the surviving Native Americans, because they continue to survive. And for black people, as Baldwin points out, and then Brunel takes that and go and riffs on it for an extended chapter. For black people, the threat of erasure has often been characterized as don't let what happened to the Indians happen to you, as if all the Indians were killed. And so it's almost implied. So when you look at something like the heart of they fall, I'm looking at it not for the entertainment, not for the explosions. Oh, that's great. I mean, I have any critique. Hey, it's an entertaining two hours. Well done. Well acted. All this kind of thing. And I'm not suspending. In fact, the reason I can enjoy it is because I'm not looking to it for anything other than mindless watching shit blow up and interesting fights and, <laughs> and, and jokes. Why? Because I will learn nothing from this because I know that your framework is basically a white nationalist framework in blackface. In other words, y'all out here trying to, I'm going to build an all-black town. Yeah. Where the Native Americans? Where's the critique? Where's the, oh, wait, well, I'm not looking at that for this. I just want to see Lakeith Stanfield. Or I want to see, you know, what Regina and Zay-Z going, they going to fight. And I see, I see you got the bowler then. Are y'all coming back? Huh? Okay. See the man Daryl Lindo in anything. Daryl Lindo, when he's playing a villain, I told y'all about that time Del Rolindo came to Howard and we had the August Wilson conference. Shout out to Sandra Shannon, the founder of the August Wilson Society and all my colleagues who helped. We all founded that at the year after August Wilson made transition. And uh, his, 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 his daughter was there. Uh, Del Rolindo was sitting here and he's like, man, when I played in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, Harold, Harold Loomis, and I was on Broadway, I knew I had nailed it when I looked out in the crowd and there was this black woman sitting in the front row with a look of complete and utter horror on her face. I had scared the shit out of her. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Daryl Lindo. Lindo is West Indian Archie. Remember when Giselle Washington came in there and was like, Archie, I'm sorry, man. What you drinking? What you drinking? What you drinking? He was like, I ain't drinking out of piss with you. <laughs> and then he was like, did you, you remember the bet? You remember the bet? He said, what bet? It, and then, hey, man. He don't forget no numbers. His rep is on the line. And then Daryl and Nendo looked at him and he just kind of looked at him in the face like he's going to kill him. And then at that moment, you realize that Daryl and Nendo was going to take Denzel Washington's life. So he just looks at him like. Sticks the money under the glass, puts it there and gets up and leaves. And the other cat is like. Ah. My man Red, night to you. <laughs> anyway, Daryl Lindo with a look can tell you this. So I'm saying I'm looking for that on the heart of day fall. I'm not looking at this because I know the framework is what Clyde Taylor would call almost uh, a discursive irony. Mm. In other words, what Ta Taylor would read a film like that, I think, and say, this is one of the dominant ironies. In other words, these are black people play acting like white people. Now, they've got panache, they got some jokes, they got some quips, but the general Western motif, the, the general framework of the Western has not been disturbed. Now, if you contrast that with Thomasine and Bushrod, it's a little bit of a different thing. And that, again, not a critique 
at all because we understand that it's very entertaining it goes on but i'm saying you can't really talk about displacing the notion of the nation state unless you displace the notion of the nation state and that's dangerous work which is why robert levine i i respect that you're a committed american i am not but i'm an american citizen and you're an american citizen that don't mean whether it be paying taxes driver's licenses passports that i will not avail myself of the rules and regulations if they do in fact apply to everyone which is what douglas i am convinced delaney mary ann shed and all of them francis ellen watkins harper them were fighting about we want the same rules to apply to us to everybody else and then when they asked douglas well what do you want douglas said all oh, the negro want is to be left alone let the rules apply now that becomes inconvenient when you're trying to build a country based on you know just come on now give us just give a chance if you just keep working it just give us a chance why because i mean i mean i like to watch you lamar jackson running up and down the, now i haven't seen one play in the career of lamar jackson why because i'm not watching the nfl no more at some point you got to have self-respect at least in my that's how i'm constructing others would say no you got fine but the idea is you can't start no black league and if you start a rogue league in terms of class it amazes me professor hunter that to this day i was watching an interview bob costas did with candace jackson that just aired you know, I'm a uh, Candace Parker and, you know, remarkable basketball talent, you know, smart sister, very, you know, photogenic and, you know, she's telegenic, you know, I mean, telegenic. She's she does well on television, you know, commentators kind of thing. Her career was, you know, spotless from beginning to end. Again, we talk about colorism. We talk about classism. I think what ha what happened to the sister that preceded her, Shamika Holesclaw for the University of Tennessee. You remember Shamika who had the challenge, she you know, talk. I covered her. Yeah. No question. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm like, y'all don't forgot about Shamik. She's still alive, right? But, you know, she had the challenges, you know, emotional. I mean, what? but she ain't Candace Park. That's the whole, yeah, again, what we were talking about earlier. But I'm listening to this and I'm saying, and she's talking about, you know, uh, Bob Costas was like, well, yeah, you know, uh, the finals of WNBA, the last game was sold out. I mean, it's growing in popularity. And I just keep thinking and reminding in the back of my head, maybe because I was living in Columbus, Ohio at the time, because they had a franchise. Professor, do you you remember this? Remember that uh, that outfit called the ABL? Oh, the one where they had the women dunking in the uh, leotards? No, no. Oh, oh, no, no. Wait. Okay. No, that's something else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. No, no, no. I'm talking about the one where. They were they put the teams deliberately in small market or mid market teams, places where they had college After college like Tennessee and, and Ken, Ken, yeah that was that's smart. right and part of their structure was profit sharing with the players right so David Stern rest wherever you are because you know what you try to do Allen Iverson and boys I don't care about Stern anyway Stern you know go over there maybe you and PW both that can get together and have a chat now mm -hmm. but remember what the NBA did the NBA very quickly created the WNBA at a perpetual annual loss. Put those teams in teams in places where the NBA had teams. And their first objective was to kill the ABL. And they because did. they said again. And they did. And they killed it so effectively that I don't hear anyone. I think the only team that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and, 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 but, but the most prominent team that survived mm -hmm. was the Connecticut team. Mm -hmm. and, they curated, and they curated through players like Teresa Edwards and pl players that were actually, as a, so the, w, the WNBA is going to give you Rebecca Lobo. And but it, anyways, let me not. Mm -hmm. No, this is very important because it may y'all you know we kind of gone around several places but we're going to tie all this together the the whole point is that whether it be athletics see, see sports is a way to build national identity mm -hmm. so we understand that whether it be jamaica whether it be the super eagles in nigeria in terms of soccer whether it be the ghanaian team when the Tissina under team cameroon remember when the cameroon team the soccer team had died in the in the plane crash that was the same year serena williams was burning them up in the french open and she came out 
the next match in in a dress in their form fitting dress you know serena gonna rock the style but it was the colors of the cameroonian flag and all them black people in france cheered for her because there's so many africans from french speaking countries and the cameroonian soccer team had taken that l when the plane crashed and killed so many of their members i mean that's nation beyond state boundaries and so whether it be but see understand how whiteness works whiteness wants its black vassals to be loyal so when Allen Iverson would show up at the at the Sixers uh, post game conference uh, with a with a Jim Brown jersey on, oh my God! Or Bill Russell joined with the Celtics, and they, and these and these white boys in Philly would lose their minds. You play for the Sixers, he's paying tribute to his elders. But y'all are looking at it from your social structure. You work for us, nigga. What's wrong with you? Meanwhile, the governance structure, we like, we see why they wear them throwback jerseys. I'm looking at like, thank God, this young man right here has enough presence of mind to build in his genealogy he's building in movement and memory whatever else he is or isn't we ain't here to litigate out Iverson but I'm saying the response to that speaks to the question of nationalism so whether it be Jamie Harrison whether it be any folk who, who are looking at trying to build something that never existed they are going to continue to butt their head against the wall because what they probably know I'm not going to say because they're not stupid but they refuse to act as if they know see Adam Clayton Powell with the caveat being that he was able to do what he's able to do because he can move back and forth. But he did, given that quote unquote advantage, use it for the race, right. which, is, you know, which is very important. And understand that these cats who are going to keep doing it in spite of the reality, they're never going to get anywhere. And if they fool enough of us, we're going to be on our knees taking an L2. Now, let me let me let me tie that to um to where we were going initially today. Um, thinking about Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon doesn't have a commitment to the nation state. As you said, Steve Bannon has a commitment to a concept, to an idea. And so when you read an article like what we see here in the New York Times yesterday on Brazil, Bannon is in that. Because Bolazero, in fact, let me just mention one other thing. For the American ideologues pushing a right-wing nationalist movement, Brazil is one of the most important pieces on the global chessboard. With 212 million people, it is the world's sixth largest nation, the dominant force in South America, and home to an overwhelmingly Christian population that continues to shift to the right. Brazil also rich, represents a rich economic opportunity with abundant natural resources made more available by Mr. Balanzaro. Then it goes on. Why am I bringing that up? Brazil also has, as we all know, the largest population of African descended people anywhere outside of Africa, including the United States. So when the New York Times, the paper of record for whiteness, writes a social structure article on the front page that was written by James Nikas, uh, N-I-C-A-S, saying that, oh, this population is moving to the right. What do you, yeah, Christian. Christianity is the key there because Christianity is one of those concepts, one of those cultural meaning making concepts, one of those ways of knowing where whiteness can hide. And so you got black people in Brazil. And of course, going back to Adam Clayton Powell for a second, one drop rule not going to mean much in Brazil because they got dozens of categories of race. And so this makes it deeply problematic. We talked about Pele a couple of weeks ago. And we didn't talk about that. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. What Bannon is doing, as you say, he got a map of the world and he's in and out, in and out, in and out. In fact, let me mention one other place he's probably got his fingers in. Also on the, on the same front page of the New York Times yesterday, Europe, Europe now, Europe nears boiling point, not over COVID, although they're talking about an explosion in COVID in the next few months. Europe nears boiling point over borders. Watch this. Warsaw. Thousands of migrants, unwilling weapons, and a geopolitical struggle in peril in a freezing border zone. Far-right nationalists marching on the streets of Warsaw, calling for harsh action against asylum seekers. Belligerent national leaders facing off across a razor wire border. Andrew Higgins writes, a standoff over migrants along the Eastern Europeans' eastern flank, one that EU leaders have said has been manufactured by the authoritarian government of Belarus, is growing more volatile, highlighting the raw emotions driving a crisis on that country's border with Poland. Belarus, with this authoritarian that's been installed, y'all better check Steve Bannon. 
They send in migrants through Poland into the EU from the so-called Middle East. Now, if you don't think there's a connection between what's being fomented in the eastern countries in the EU and what's going on at the border of Texas, you're not paying attention. These white boys are not playing nation state politics. They are playing geopolitics. And when we start focusing on the United States, like CRT is the issue, them hillbillies ain't in that conversation either because they nationalists. They're American nationalists. Jamie Harrison and them ain't in that conversation either because they think the chessboard is just the United States and they're going to be good soldiers. But I'm going to tell you who's in on the chessboard. Joe Biden is on the chessboard. Kamala Harris is on the chessboard. They can give speeches about America and the greatest country in the world. But let's be very clear. Their interests are the interests of those who fund them and the geopolitical advisors. So when you see what's going on in Haiti right now with Ariel Henry, as we talked about, when you see what's the prime minister who they installed and are propping up so they can figure out which government's going to let them conduct business as usual. When you see what's going on in Ethiopia, as we talked about with Ahmed Abi. And you see that the Eritrean, the, not Eritrean, the um, Tigrayan, Tigrayan, right. Tigray are making this move and they're closer to Addis and every day it gets closer and closer to destabilization. And you, you can pay attention to that and should, but what you should also pay very close attention to is how Europe reacts. People are talking about Kamala Harris went to uh, France this week and she spoke with a fake French accent. Let me tell you something. Now, every hillbilly who's saying that is either somebody driving hillbillies crazy, <laughs> using hillbilly in the broad sense, or hillbillies ain't been nowhere. Because if you've ever traveled, I'm telling you, Teddy, I mean, if you've ever traveled, if you're a person of African descent, I'll use myself as just a quick example. When I go to Africa, wherever I am at in Africa, I find myself moving toward the affect of the people. And of course, with African people, it's often verbal without words. Uh -huh, mm, uh -huh. So we go here. Uh, okay. Often the upward inflection is very much so. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you say we go, you're not faking an accent. It's really almost like empathy. It's almost like you're trying to tune your ear to the people. Now, I'm not saying what Kamala Harris was or what's new, but these people saying she used a fake French accent. Well, do you, you can't use your fake hillbilly accent. You ain't never been talking to somebody who speaks a different language and you both find yourselves trying to find some common ground of affect. Happens all the time. People slow down their speech. People are very deliberate. <laughs> you go in the store. No, no, no. And you go into a Korean store and they speak in. You know, okay, what is this? Two for five. Okay, two for five. Wait, you just said that the way he said it. Why did you say that the way he said it? Because you think maybe they'll understand it quick, quicker. In other words, this isn't mockery, although sometimes it is, I must say. I mean, people are human. But anyway, I won't get too, too far in that. Steve Bannon is an internationalist playing nationalisms, whether it be Belarus, whether it be Poland, whether it be Brazil, whether it be the United States. These are not separate things. They are putting together. Meanwhile, black folk have to be very careful because we don't understand that our politics in the United States must be driven with an awareness of what's going on globally, we will continue to be fodder for the plans of other people who don't respect those boundaries. And those are the people at the top of the food chain. Those are the people who Joe Manchin is working for. It ain't just West Virginia. It ain't just the United States. This is international. And I, I don't want to bring this home very quickly because this is something I had intended on talking about uh, when we started, but I think maybe this actually this gives me another week. Um, this question of how this stuff is driven. In fact, we should just pause here for a second because, in fact, maybe I won't even. I, I'm gonna bring it up because yesterday I was telling folk I, I left when I left. I was going to check on these kids and meet up with some of the folks who were doing the rally in a couple of hours at Howard, and I um had two books in my bag that I've been reading. One is Abdullah Kalamat's new book, The History of Black Studies. Very important. Abdullah Kalamat is a founding father in the modern phase of black studies. It's an incredibly informative work. It is driven by his ideological posture, uh, his kind of materialist framework, his paradigm of unity, as he calls it. I have a great deal of respect for this brother. I haven't seen him in a few years. In fact, the last time I saw him, we were together at Purdue. That was why I'm looking here because I got an award there. Uh, Purdue 2018. We were there for a conference. 
Um, and he and I, you know, were back and forth and spar and sparring a little bit because he's a historical materialist, and I respect that. Um, I respect historical materialism a great deal as, as a framework of analysis, and he's a committed uh race man in many ways. And you know, I'm a race, I'm a race man. The way Ida B. Wells was a race woman and called herself that, you know. Uh, not to the exclusion of anybody else. There's only one race, the human race, but in terms of the advancement of African people, very clear. Where we diverge, I think, is where we would put our emphasis and perspective on the long genealogy. That's why I wrote the article, What Black Studies Is Not. Uh, he's clearly in Black Studies. He's the founding father of Black Studies, but the way he approaches Black Studies, for me, is not Africana Studies in the way I would approach it. In that respect. So I was reading that, but I was also reading this. This is a fascinating book. This is young scholar, Mar Maribel Morey, uh, White Philanthropy. Carnegie Corporation is an American dilemma in the making of a white world order. Now we're kind of backing up topics that I want to talk about. Maybe when we have office hours on Monday, I'll say something a little bit about this because it's causing me to go back now and reread. This is volume two of an American dilemma. This is the actual book she's writing about. Talk about internationalism. Here's the point I'm making. I'm going to tie it to Bannon and we and close for today because we're going to we'll pick this up next week. Gunnar Murdahl. I'm sorry. Let me go. Gunnar Murdahl was a Swedish social scientist. He wrote two volumes, over a thousand pages in American Dilemma, Negro Problems in Modern Democracy. He was called on by the Carnegie Foundation to come to America and do this survey. White man from Sweden. Because there were no social scientists that could study the black problem in the United States. So Carnegie had to go and get this white man from Sweden because there were really no social scientists. There's no scholars, certainly no black scholars who, wait. Hmm, 1940. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course there were. There was Du Bois. There was Ed Franklin Frazier. There was um, Ralph Bunch. In fact, my man, uh, Zach Williams, wrote an excellent book on this. I'm looking back here because I usually keep it somewhere close. Oh, I don't see it. My man, Zachary Williams. This one I'm not even going to look for. I'll just mention it. Um, uh, he wrote a book on the Howard University social scientists that were at Howard in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, cats like uh, Doxy Wilkerson. Bad dude. You gotta look up Doxy Wilkerson. Man, Ralph Bunch. Of course, Charlie Houston. Charles Hamilton Houston was uh, still at the law school at the time. Charles Thompson, the editor of the Journal of Negro Education. Uh, Merz Tate. Woo! Merz Tate. Talk about international. This sister right here, Oxford train. Um, not that that means much, but it meant something at that time because they ain't letting black nobodies in Oxford. Merz Tate was no joke on international work. Um, the, they're all at Howard. Why? Because Jim Crow. Now, other HBCUs had legends as well. Here's a dude that's going to show up in this. And when we talk about this, the great Oliver Cromwell Cox, son of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, this is his book, Cast, Class and Race. If you read Isabel Wilkerson's book. And if you're in Texas, you better hurry up and read it because it's on the banned book list that that hillbilly legislator down there, what's his name, Matt somebody or other, Matt Kraus, Republican legislator from Fort Worth, he got a 800 and something uh, uh, list of books that he wants out of the libraries in Texas. And my thing is, Matt, you ain't got you leave them books in the library. Why? Because like you, them hillbillies ain't reading. <laughs> anybody check that book ain't any books i got it ain't never been checked out but anyway um the point that, that Mar maribel maury is making is that these white boys at the carnegie institution including frederick keppel and they paid for a number of studies at this time i pulled one to reread this is lord haley's book an african survey revised he did the original book before this and then they he went throughout africa and wrote up that how these systems were developing but my point is this Thomas Jesse Jones for the Phelps Stokes Foundation. These are cats that would do battle with Du Bois and them boys over funding. This is uh, Thomas Jesse Jones' massive Negro education, a study of the private and higher schools for colored people in the United States, edited by Thomas Jesse Jones, originally published in uh, two volumes in 1916. This is 700 pages long. They're studying black people because after enslavement, and as Jim Crow descends in the South, they got to figure out in the United States how we going to control these Negroes. In Africa, they see the resistance to colonialism and realizing after World War II that they got to control these Negroes. How are we going to set up these education systems? And so what Maury does is go to a book that is considered a classic, an American dilemma, two volumes. What, is, what does this boy do? What, is, uh, what does uh, Murdoch do? He comes to the United States. Carney gives him the money. He then convenes 
a number of scholars, including some of those Howard University scholars, one of which was Ralph Bunch. This is one of the volumes that Ralph Bunch wrote in a matter of less than a year. This is called The Political Status of the Negro in the Age of FDR. He got his students to go out and interview all these people. This is 700 pages. That's one of four essays. Let me see if I find the other one because I pulled that for a very specific reason. And I said I was going to mention, oh, man, not going to be able to put my hands on it till I do. So the point is, <laughs> this is uh, a two of the second one, a brief and tentative analysis of Negro leadership. Ralph Bunch writes this. He's in his 30s. Look at the head. This is the black social scientist. This is what Murdoch is using to rely for his book. Uh, we're going to talk about this next week. This is he's writing about Negro leadership. He surveys Negro leadership types. He sends this document, this piece out, this, this questionnaire. He's got a list at the end, an appendix index of Negro leaders. Page 198. Let me just give you a sense of who is included in this book that he's surveying. This is 1940. Bunch is recruited by Murdoch, Doxy Wilkerson too, out of Howard to write this, this, the, these memos that he's going to use. Look at Appendix 1. When I tell you Robert Abbott, uh, let me just go give you a few. I'll give you maybe five or, or ten. Ernest Alexander, Raymond Pace Alexander, Sadie Alexander. These are the lawyers out of Philly, right? Um, you've got uh, let me get out of the A's and come over here. You got Du Bois on there, of course. Rufus Atwood, who was the president of Kentucky State. I mean, anyway, I'll just show you. Mm. See, these are the black leaders that he talked to, sent pieces to, made a compendium to. Ralph Bunch is a whole beast. He was a scholar. Look, I'm still flipping pages. <laughs> you understand? Then he has leadership schedule tables. He's got um, organization leaders, Walter White, Marcus Garvey, Charles Houston, William Pinson, uh, Pickens, A. Philip Randolph, Eugene Kinkle Jones, newspapers, George Schuyler, Ralph Matthews, Carl Murphy, Robert Van, Claude Barnett, politics, Frederick Douglass, Arthur Mitchell, M. J. Scott, William Hasty, Jane Bolin, he keeps going, church, Father Divine, Richard Allen, education, Booker T. Washington, Mary Clyde Bethune, Woodson, Du Bois, Kelly Miller, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Robert Reed goes on. He even has radicals, Ben Davis, Angelo Herndon, John Davis, James Ford. I'm just giving you a taste. The last one he has on here, insurrectionist. Who does he have? Nat Turner. The whole point, Ralph Bunch is right. Now, what does he do with this? What does he do with these memos? This is what Maury is writing about, and I'll end with this. This is the, from the back of the book. She says, since the publication in 1944, many Americans have described Gunnar Murdahl's un-American, what I do with you? Eh, Y'all saw it. I ain't got to show it to you again. Gunnar Murdahl's un-American dilemma. Hmm. Yeah, you better hide from me, sweet. Let's go. Since its publication is 1944, many Americans have described Gunnar Murdahl's un-American dilemma as the defining text on U.S. race relations. Here, Maribel Mori confirms with historical evidence what many critics of the book have suspected. Okay, hold on. Let me finish this. The reason I look that way is because in the governance structure, they knew it all along. Bunch knew it. Oliver Cox critiques him in this in this book right here, Race, Class, and Class. Stokely Carmichael critiques him in Black Power with Charles Hamilton. The black scholars, Du Bois, gives him that work. They knew it all along. But Maury says, here, Mary Beryl Maury confirms with historical evidence, where well, they didn't have evidence, what many critics of the book have suspected. An American Dilemma was not commissioned, funded, or written with the goal of challenging white supremacy. Indeed, instead, Maury reveals that it was commissioned by Carnegie Corporation President Frederick Keppel and researched and written by Murdoch with the intent of solidifying white rule over black people in the United States. Shocked. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, point. Now, one thing I'll say about this lady, I don't know her. I'm going to try to track her down because she is the founding executive director of the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences. She wrote, I was reading this yesterday when I was down at the Museum of, Af uh, the Museum of African Art, which I always go to. And so I go down there and I was sitting in the room where I, they have a page from Ahmed Baba's treatise from 1592. This African scholar, his name was Ahmed Baba Al Timbuktu. He was in Timbuktu, one of the greatest scholars in the Western Sudan in the 16th century and 17th century, taken into exile. Um, he the, the page is from a treatise he wrote on the difference between uh, good intentions, great intentions, and the correct thing to do morally. And I'm thinking, wow, this is quite an irony. I'm sitting here reading uh, Kayla Martin and reading Maury. But Maury writes this in the introduction to her book. She said, after researching this book and seeing the inordinate influence that foundations have 
on shaping the way that these insurgent movements, that black movements and things like that, and black people are characterized and realizing the irony that I used money from this same group of formations, including Carnegie, to write this book. I walked away from the university system and I co-founded the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences in Florida. And I thought about it and I laughed to myself because I'm thinking, what you think we doing with narrative? Mm -hmm. She knows so much about how these, to this day now, so when people get grants, and I'm talking to some people now who just got some money, who are some, what be considered hardcore, you know, for the race kind of thing, and listening to the strings the money comes with, when they give out these grants and give out these awards, sure it's prestige, sure it's social structure recognition, but it doesn't come without tethers. And finally, what Maury says is, here's the rest of the quote. It says, Maury also impacts the text itself, that book, two volumes, arguing that Murdoch ultimately complemented his funders' intentions for the project by keeping white Americans as his principal audience and guiding them toward a national policy program on black Americans that would keep intact white domination. Because for Murdoch and Carnegie Corporation alike, international order rested on white Anglo-Americans' continued ability to dominate effectively. Jamie Harris. Mm -hmm. What you understand, brother, is that your fight is not in South Carolina alone. It's not in the United States alone. It ain't with the Democratic Party alone. Your fight is with a global system that has local branches. And what they brought their white boy Murdoch over here to do is say, we fund these studies of blackness all over. We funded them in Africa. We funded these guys before you in collaboration with the Phelps Stokes Fund and stuff like that. Well, what about the blacks? Yes, we know Du Bois did his Encyclopedia Negro Project. We know that, but we ain't really talk. In fact, if you want to pay some of the Negroes, fine, because they can make very good eyes and ears in places you can't go. And when you absorb all that, here's the project we need. And they, they write this. Murdoch writes this in American Dilemma. He says, the world is becoming even more non-white. The United States is assuming leadership in terms of the white rule countries, but that's not going to be permanent. So what the United States needs to figure out to do in order to extend its influence, which may last another few decades, Murdoch is predicting the end of whiteness in terms of ruling is shore up its attitude toward the Negro. So let me write, let me take all these reports, write this huge book for white people in the United States to help you have a manual for keeping these Negroes under control. And if, you don't, and if you don't think that it's still not there, all you gotta do is turn your television, go any place other than Nubia and a few other places and narrative and a few other places and look at how the black people that are curated talk about black relationship to this country with tears, with rage, with righteous indignation. So many of them, my friends, who talk about it with great prescience, great clarity, great analysis until they get to the very end, at which point they bring all that rage, all that indignation, all that genius, and they're driving a the car. We finally gonna get free. And then they turn it into the ditch of, we're better than that. We have to be, be what, what you, oh, hey, I see where you were. Oh, I said, I like, grant you got, oh, I saw the prestige. It's very nice. What? And now you know why black people don't listen to you. Now, we, we nod politely. When we see you, it's very nice. And we're all friends. You still get a plate. You know, Thanksgiving coming. You get turkey leg. We all talk crap. And then when we get a little taste, or some of y'all who smoke, you get a little smoke. You sit back and Chaw. Eddie, come here, man. You know that's some bullshit. Yeah, I know, man. But I'll lose my job. I know, I know, bro. I'm just playing with you, man. Turn on TV, man. What's the score? <laughs> In other words, we know you know. Jamie, we know you know, bro. It's okay. It's okay, but don't let the mummy keep slapping you on the back of the neck. Yeah, but it's not it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. And I think I think they don't know. They don't know no. They might inherently know, but they don't know no. I don't think they know. You don't think so? No, I don't. I don't oh, think we're gonna end. I think I, I just scanned the chat right after you. The chat lives until you shut it down, so we're gonna keep the chat up. Cap, yeah, keep that. Yeah. Hey, would love to hear Dr. Carr's thoughts on Sadie Taylor's Allen that one day. I just got this book about a week and a half ago. Look at me. Sadie Tanner Alexander, Democracy, Race, and Justice, The Speeches and Writings. We got to talk about Sadie Tanner so many people we Alexander. Don't know. I'm tired of us being curated too. We need to know all of the folk, the Martin Delaney's and all of the folk. Yes. There. Um, and this, also this one here, 
Dunbar High School. Show me the joint you about to show. No, this, you know, this book has been banned. This is my buddy Jerry Kraft. Oh yes, it, uh, and I love him. He's such an amazing human being. Uh, Why would they ban that book? Comic book, you know, uh, with children in it. It's a uh, seventh grader, the new kid. I just want to get the book. I uh, love it. They're banning it. They're banning it. They're so, so silly. Kendrick Lamar, maybe we could talk about that on Monday. Uh, yeah, talk about Kendrick at the at the uh, Vegas Bay in Vegas. Uh, and he brings like what looks like the fruit of Islam onto the stage, right? And they're doing a formation while he's singing, which visually looks powerful. I don't know how you feel about it, but we'll talk. Oh, about I mean, that. Public Enemy used to do that all the time, right? Yes, yes. And you know, we, because we lack memory, we do things and we think it's original. Uh, and uh, just a correction: it was the Dirty Dozen that um, Jim. Brown oh, the Dirty Dozen. He retired on that one. The, the, the World War the World War II film. That's yes, right. Okay, yes, good. That's, Thank you. That's what Thank gave you. him a check out. And there was some other things, but that's why we're here. You know, whatever is is not 100%, y'all do your research. You know, yeah, we I'm all, going from memory. It, it, yeah. I had no notes. Off the it, top of your head, if you know for sure, like drop it in the chat. Would you please? I'm going to I'm yeah. going to spend a few minutes with the chat after we sign off. So, oh yeah, Anna Julia Cooper for sure, Nietzsche. We're going to do all of them. Oh, and we must talk uh uh Professor Hunter on Monday. You 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 hit me to this, and then I went and, and read it. The um, this University of Austin business. We'll talk about it on Monday because there's a whole history of those conservative colleges. Remember after the Scopes Monkey trial, there's one in Tennessee that still exists, named for William Jennings Bryan. So I mean, there, there, there are a number of those. Nick, Nixon went to one. Wheaton. Wheaton is one of those schools. Nixon yeah. went to a, a white nationalist college. Wheaton at, in Illinois was one of those schools. In other words, they've been doing this for literally over a century trying to start schools but they usually fail either because they can't get their money together or the students uh erupt or they realize that universities have to be administered and so a lot of them like uh what's the the one i just mentioned brian in tennessee they turn into christian liberal arts colleges bob jones is one. Oh, okay. yeah bob jones is one Listen, uh, I need you to be safe out in them streets. Uh, Y'all who are going to Howard, you know, bring all your good love and energy for those students. Was it day 32? 32, um, they going uh, on, yes. And, uh, you know, everyone who's out there protesting, let it in. And I hope the administration realizes power plays with young people who are paying to, to get something from you. You are a steward. You serve them. This is not a power play. This is not about breaking them. This is not about, you're wrong. They deserve to have great facilities. They're fighting for something that they should have and they shouldn't have to fight for it. And if you are a president of a college and you're an administrator and you're a trustee and you're fighting these kids, you're on the wrong side of history. It's not going to end well for you in the annals of history. You're wrong. That's Fix right. it. Show up for these kids. Yeah. President Frederick, show up for the kids. Stop, stop the power plays. Come on, bro. President at their behest. Right. Stay around. So right. One team. Hard. It's one team. We all together. Let's be together. That's what today is about. It ain't about, come on now. We all together on this. Yes, we are one. Uh, so thank you for being out there no in solidarity one. with the babies. With the oh, children. got to. All right. And no and love everybody. Thank you all. And, you know, if, if you were inclined to join us, uh, come through narrative. We need all hands on deck. This is, all not, hands. This is not a spectator sport. We That's expect right. people to come in, bring a break help build the world we want to live in. This is a long process. So That's right. uh, we appreciate the grace and the patience and the love. And the love. We Man, I'm telling you, I'm going to keep the chat open, Prof, because I'm looking at people. They got Ira to read. Yeah, we can talk about all these cats. In fact, I saw some Ira to read wrote at, at, at your institution, at Hunter College, over there. What's the name? Is it the Roosevelt House? Yes, Roosevelt House. Yeah, I was at the so Roosevelt it, House for some. Literally the house that Roosevelt grew up in. Yeah. See, individuals don't beat institutions. Come on, y'all. We, we got to build this pyramid. Why? Because they got places, yo. We need places. We need places. <laughs> we need places. Love you. Love you, Love you too. You. I'll see you on Monday. Yes, ma'am. See you.